Good morning, everybody. We're just giving people a minute or two to uh, log on, but a big welcome to everybody joining us for the 2021 China Institute Executive Summit. We're so delighted to have you all join us today and tomorrow for what I know will be very enlightening discussions with some of China's and America's top investors and thinkers. We're actually in for two days of really special and enlightening discussion. I'm James Heimowitz, and I'm the president of China Institute. We've been in the business of explaining China and building bridges between the US and China for nearly 100 years. And I can't think of a time when that mission was more important than today. This is really a very challenging moment with increasingly intense US-China competition. The US is adjusting to a new global paradigm in which there are two superpowers, not just one. And after a century, almost a century of global economic and political dominance, this isn't an easy reality for the US to accept. America's technological and economic dominance are being challenged like never before, certainly not like in the last century. And at the same time, we see China more recently making some actually very dramatic changes, driving a, a populist agenda of self-reliance and redirecting economic reform efforts to what seems to be more centralized controls. So we have this as a kind of a backdrop and we're going to bring you some views and perspectives, many of which are coming right from on the ground in China, that we hope are gonna make you all think hard about our assumptions and perhaps even challenge the conventional wisdom that seems to be hardening in Washington, DC. I think one of the really important questions is, how can we be at the same time so-called strategic competitors and also have a healthy business and economic interaction and relationship? And ideally, hopefully, even begin to collaborate and work together on intransigent global problems. Well, before we set out to try, these, to, try to answer some of these questions, because I don't think we're gonna answer them all this morning in this next two days, um, I just wanted to reach out and say a big few important thank yous to our sponsors and to our partners, without whom we couldn't make and present this conference. First and above all, to our strategic partners, the Center for China and Globalization and the South China Morning Post, who helped us reach out to speakers, both in the mainland and in Hong Kong, to pull this together. And a big thank you as well to some of our corporate sponsors, to Broad Group, one of China's most sustainably focused companies, to the Bank of China, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary here, here in New York, and to Tronix, which has been working hard to ensure the world has PPE to protect frontline workers and the general public. I also want to thank uh, all of our corporate members that are participating today. And that includes Citigroup, Dorsey, First Republic Bank, Gemdale, Haitung, Morgan Stanley, Philip Morris, United Airlines, Tengyue, Wanxiang, and Vanki. We couldn't do it all without your support. And one last thank you above all to my colleague, Dinda Elliott, who's worked so hard to pull this together for yet another year. We're in for a real treat. We're in for a real stimulating discussion. So without further ado, let me hand it over to my colleague, Dinda Elliott. Thank you, James. Um, welcome again, everybody. Uh, my name, as James said, is Dinda Elliott, and I'm the Director of Programs at China Institute. <clears throat> and I will remind you that we will be taking some questions from the audience whenever we can throughout the day. So please feel free to type your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get to them. Uh, if we can't, we'll share them with the speakers and try to get answers for you later. Um, as James said, these are very challenging times with so many rapidly changing policies, both in the United States and in China. It sometimes feels inevitable that these two countries could become not just competitors, but enemies with potentially devastating consequences for international business, not to mention global stability. And so it's my great pleasure and honor to start today with a conversation with two of the most thoughtful practitioners and thinkers in Beijing and DC. <clears throat> Wang Hui Yao, president of the Center for, Con for China and Globalization, which as James said, is our strategic partner for this conference. And Amy Selico, who has served in numerous senior positions in the US government and now advises multinationals doing business in China at the Albright Stonebridge Group. 
So welcome, Dr. Wong and Amy. We're so excited to have you with us to try to grapple with some of these very challenging questions. Um, so let's just jump right in. I, I wanted to ask you each to begin by talking a bit about what the US-China business relationship looks like right now from your vantage point. So let's start with Amy. Um, we've all been trying to determine what the US-China policy is under the Biden administration. The trade tariffs imposed by Trump remain in place, and the Secretary of Commerce, just to cite one example, recently suggested that the US should work with Europe to quote unquote, slow China's technological, that's not a quote, sorry, to slow China's technological advance. Um, so the question for you is how hard is the Biden administration's new China policy and what, what do you see and what do you worry about? Well, Dinda, thank you uh, for inviting me to be with you all um, today from Washington, D.C. and with Dr. Wang uh, with, from Beijing. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to try to level set um, where we are and, and bring a perspective from Washington, which I hope is a bit um, optimistic about how a very difficult relationship, as James just laid out, and so did you, uh, can be managed and the importance of this relationship to the business community maintain, uh, remains so very, very critical. I mean, as, as you said, without a doubt, the, the Biden administration uh, means to be taking a very tough line as it develops its range of policies uh, towards China. And as we've heard uh, repeated by so many cabinet members, this range is meant to encompass areas of competition, cooperation, and confrontation. I, for one, am encouraged that over the past few weeks, we have seen members of the administration engage directly with their Chinese counterparts on a range of issues that are clearly meant to form a foundation for building some common ground on these very challenging issues. Obviously, Secretary Kerry continues uh, to engage on climate, Ambassador Tai, now on trade, state and defense department officials on mill-to-mill -mill relations and security issues, including North Korea. And of course, the meeting that uh, the National Security Advisor had with State Counselor Yang in Zurich to discuss, of course, the, the entire range of issues for US-China relations, including, very importantly, arranging for a virtual presidential summit to take place later this year. Clearly competition is the dominant theme of these discussions, but common ground does still exist on some of these issues. And that's encouraging for business. And dare I say, encouraging for all of us watching US-China tensions continue to rise on a number of issues, specifically on the trade front. Let me just say, we know the administration wants to pursue a tough set of policies meant to address areas of the relationship where American interests are being undermined. And I'm encouraged by the statements that Secretary Raimondo and Ambassador Tai have made over the past week, again, about directly engaging with Chinese counterparts. Secretary Raimondo saying we have to have robust commercial engagement that will help mitigate some of the other tensions in the relationship. Where I guess I'm worried is how we set those parameters of cooperation around trade. Ambassador Tai gave a very important speech last week, um, laying out the beginnings of what a framework around China trade policy will be. And when she was asked specifically about enhancing market access for American companies and farmers, exporters to China, she a little bit waffled on that question and talked about the rules around trade and the fact that Clearly the WTO needs to be grappling with how um, to set rules for fair trade that enhances the position of the United States and its workers, as well as the global economy. So I guess that's one area where we need to be watching very closely to make sure, again, that there are opportunities for American businesses who want to be in China, who want a level playing field to be in China. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, so Dr. Wong, with Beijing's new drive for self-reliance, uh, some foreign companies and uh, their employees even are saying they feel less welcome in China these days. So, you know, and they worry that self-reliance 
will bleed over into financial markets, IPOs, technology, and trade. Uh, so how hard is China's US policy? What do you see and what, what are you worried about? Okay, great. Uh, uh, thanks, Tinda, and, uh, and uh, good morning and good evening for all of you. And also thanks, Amy, uh, for joining the discussion. So what, what I, I think this is a really a great discussion that we're having here. Uh, I, I think we have already seen some uh, uh, past development in the last uh, several weeks. I, I understand that it takes time for President Biden uh, to, uh, to take care domestically, the pandemic fighting, you know, economics. But now, you know, it comes around now for the, uh, for the uh, Sino-US relations, particularly, I think, after uh, uh, the, the you know, John Kerry <laughs> visit uh, to China, after several rounds of Alaska and Tianjin and uh, now we see uh, uh, Madame, jo, uh, Madame <laughs> Meng is uh, has been released, and uh, also we're seeing hundreds of thousands of Chinese students uh, uh, got a U.S. visa, went to the United States. So, so we see that, uh, uh, as Amy said, Ambassador uh, uh, Kathleen Thayag is talking about uh, recoupling, and uh, and also we 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 see that uh, uh, you know there's a, there's a dialogue among the senior officials of both sides. I think the, uh, coming to your question that uh, Dinda is that uh, self-reliance wasn't really uh, uh, China really wants to, uh, uh, to, to do in the first place because it was uh, many of these, uh, 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 you know, if there's any tendency like that, it was really forced to because of the sanctions, because of the trade the tariff wars in the last four or five years as started from Biden uh, Trump administration. I think still that uh, we're talking uh, 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 decoupling and also talking about uh, uh, Cold War, it's, it's very unlikely. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, giving all the business uh, community uh, a still a uh, backbone of uh, Sino-US relations. And, and we can see there's more uh, US company really welcome, uh, 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 you know, the uh, Biden administration to lift the tariff. I think Chinese government has also mentioned that they, they really want to see this tariff being resolved. So, so I think it's important for both sides to, to talk on the dialogue. But on the other hand, I think this pandemic does help Chinese economy because China, now, if they have, have to be isolated, if they're forced to go on their own, they actually did actually force them to be more self-reliant. But we know this is already an intertwined world. We have to depend on each other. I think no, no, no country can you know, uh, uh, carry through everything by itself. So, so we still want to have a cooperative spirit among, uh, you know, uh, particularly the, the number largest economy and the second largest economy, rather than uh, you know, really go everything on its own. Uh, on the other hand, China is absolutely prepared. If, if re they are really forced to do it, they can self do a lot of self-reliance. I mean, during the Soviet Union era, China did that already. And I, but I, I think now we are already uh, in, a, in a more uh, complex world. We are in the 21st century. So, so digital economy is, is booming and the China is uh, doing many things. Uh, 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 international cooperation is the, is the name of the, of the game. I mean, uh, also climate change and uh, uh, infrastructure, many things. So, so I, I think that uh, uh, China can do, of course, self-reliance, but there's certainly still the due circulation actually already emphasized that. Not only domestic demand, but also international uh, 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 circulation is also important. So I think that is really the message Chinese is uh, sending out these days. Thank you, Dr. Wong. So Amy, let me pick up on, uh, Dr. Wong talked about decoupling and Secretary Tai talking about possibly recoupling. Um, do you think the moment, momentum for decoupling of the Chinese and American economies is, is kind of unstoppable at this point? Um, you know, I'm, and I'm talking beyond just low-end manufacturing moving over to Thailand or Cambodia, or whatever. Beyond that, um, what what do you see happening with with uh, decoupling? Well, I, I'm encouraged, as as Dr. Wang just mentioned, that um, that both countries are saying that's not the, the goal. Uh, the goal, if they need to, and of course for supply chain resilience purposes and to enhance. Um, economic soundness, there absolutely is a push in Beijing and from where I'm sitting here in Washington DC with the Build Back Better uh, infrastructure investment plan to enhance competitiveness for the United States on the global stage by enhancing manufacturing and investment and supply chains here in the United States. But that doesn't require decoupling. I think that you know, hearing Ambassador Tai and Secretary Raimondo 
both say that's not a practical solution for the United States was very encouraging for the business community. And the business community, of course, is looking at the supply chain challenges that continue and likely will continue through 2022. Um, energy shortages in China, of course, COVID induced uh, difficulties and enhanced costs of transportation, obviously the costs of the tariffs and the trade war still impacting businesses does mean that we have to think about diversification and ensure that we have a way to uh, enhance supply chain resilience on the global stage. But that requires not decoupling, it actually requires enhanced cooperation hmm. uh, to deal with these issues. And so again, we are not in Washington DC hearing from this administration that decoupling is a goal. In fact, the economic and trade policy makers are saying it's impractical. Let's figure out how we recouple in a sustainable way that enhances our economic and security interests. I imagine that must be a tremendous relief to the business community. I think there's been a lot of agita and concern about all this talk about decoupling, and we'll we'll hear a lot about that, you know, later today and tomorrow from the actual people on the ground, business people on the ground in China. Um, you know, it's so interesting. Also, you're talking about um, various uh, statements from uh, government leaders, and it seems to me in both countries, leaders are facing both a domestic audience and an international audience mm -hmm. and different things get said to different audiences. So, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating to see it play out. Um, let's talk about technology for a moment. Understandably, both countries are concerned about protecting their strategic technologies. Uh, the US for the first time is feeling it might lose its leadership position and it worries about China stealing technology secrets. China, on the other hand, wants to build its technological capabilities as fast as possible. So how can these two countries find ways to protect their technological interests and also find ways to collaborate? Um, Dr. Wong, you want to jump in on that one first and then we'll turn to Amy? Sure. Uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, technology wise, uh, it's we're in the 21st century and we're, we're not in the Cold War era of, of the Soviet Union or, or last century. I think technology is really benefiting uh, the whole mankind if we really handle properly, and particularly China and the U.S. Uh, on, on, on that. So we see digital economy, uh, economy is flourishing, 5G technology and uh, uh, data and artificial intelligence and all, all, the, all, the, all those uh, uh, 21st century uh, technology. I, I think that uh, we really need to harness that technology for the, for the goodness of the mankind. I think China is really uh, catching up on that. For example, we're, we're having this uh, uh, COP15 now in, in Kunming these days. Uh, 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 basically, you see China is uh, for the climate change has already developed a lot of technology, like clean, uh, clean energy vehicles uh, is already the largest producer in the world. Uh, clean, uh, you know, solar panel <laughs> power producer is the largest in the world. And hydropower producer is the largest in the world and wind power also. The so already changing that. So I think, you know, we're having a common objective and which really can work together. And also President Biden proposed this uh, B3W as, as Amy mentioned, you know, uh, build back better future. I mean, that is, that is really a great idea, realize the importance of infrastructure where a lot of technology can be applied, including uh, uh, digital and 5G and, and all the rest. So I think China's already also in that, in that position. So why, can, why not that the B3W can work together with Belt and Road? I mean, for example, and work in other countries. Uh, uh, so that the U.S. and China can really set up a, a global infrastructure investment bank. But let's upgrade the AIB to that. So, so uh, you know, that, let's think about new areas, new corporations, and the new cornerstones, and the new, uh, 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 you know, glues that really bound us together. And so that we can really uh, have this technology be really friendly to, to, to the world rather than become a, a, a dis destruction to the world. I mean, that's really important. I think most of all is that we have to build up the trust. I'm glad to see President Biden, you know, after withdraw from Afghanistan saying, okay, from now on, we're not seeking nation building. Uh, we're not really going to be, <laughs> want to be the policeman of the world now. And, and also we want to export ex democracy to other countries. Okay, if, if that is the new, new thinking, that's great. I mean, maybe we can have a, co a you know, co coexist and peacefully. And maybe we can, the world can accept China uh, peaceful rise and also allow a little different system 
so that yeah, as long as we can contribute to the prosperity of the world, let's work together and let's really uh, make up all the all the all the supplementary uh, uh, contribution to each other and to the mankind. So I think we have to really build up the trust and reduce the ideological and also also value conflicts. I think that's probably boils down to the fundamental question is, do we trust each other? If we trust each other, <laughs> we just, you know, we can share technology together. If we don't trust each other, you know, I mean, how can iPhone be used? <laughs> a billion smartphone users in China, we still, we still ride on an American plane and ride a, a, a Tesla's automobile. We still trust that. So the technology is, is, is friendly, but, but if Huawei is forbidden, if Huawei CEO is arrested, there's no trust. So, so I think now we see some good signs of that, like release of Madame Zhou, Madame Meng. We hope that uh, we will we continue this momentum and then let the top leaders and uh, and the working levels to really uh, to have a better narrative to solve those uh, conflict and and differences. I think uh, before before you jump in, Amy, it, it strikes me that both sides um, have a hard time sort of looking at these issues from a historical perspective and underestimate the 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 need for a mindset shift. So what you're describing, Dr. Wong, you know, the idea of global cooperation on infrastructure problems, for example, uh, you know, the United States is used to being the number one player in the world. And so the idea that the United States would sort of move towards a new paradigm in which it's, you know, sort of saying, yes, let's collaborate sort of as equals in terms of infrastructure building in the world, that is a huge mindset shift. And so I think that it seems like in both in China and in the United States, people underestimate this sort of historic shift that's underway. Um, and, you know, a deeper understanding of that might help us find some equilibrium. But anyway, just a, just a couple of thoughts. So Amy- yeah, Maybe Amy, I, I just add yeah. one sentence. I, I think, you know, we should really focus on the infrastructure. For example, the total length of a, a high-speed railway built in China is equal to the next 10 countries combined, where the US military budget is equal to the next 10 countries combined. So that caused a lot of problems. So let's focus on the construction and <laughs> for the mankind. I mean, uh, that's really, we, I mean, we, US and China can work together, World Bank and all the other uh, lending agencies come in. And I'm sure there's a lot of cooperation can be done between the two countries. I was riding on an Amtrak train yesterday and hearing it go ding, 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 ding. And I thought, oh my God, this is not the technology of tomorrow. But anyway, Amy, what are your thoughts about technology and collaboration? I think, you know, technology really is one of the most challenging issues um, for China in, in, in debating and deciding on policies regulating its economy and the United States. Uh, and so it's a difficult area of cooperation. I, 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 I'm very encouraged that we should think of ways to cooperate. But I do think since national security issues are so imbued in many of the technology issues and then the economic policies that regulate uh, technology issues, these are challenging times. I fully agree with Dr. Wong that we should take some of these issues out of the bilateral relationship and talk about them in terms of multilateral cooperation. And that's what we're seeing um, the Biden administration doing, just having their US EU Trade and Technology Council meeting in Pittsburgh last week and talking about global rules for technology trade, global rules for regulating how data flows uh, should proceed. The United States and China, of course, have our own interests that we need to protect and our national security considerations that are at the forefront of some technology issues. And so that does make it a challenge, but I think as we're hearing Ambassador Tai in Europe this week, tomorrow she's going to be giving a speech uh, about the WTO. I think this is where the United States is trying in the Biden administration to take some leadership in re-engaging on some of these issues outside of unilateral action and bilateral discussions, but actually trying to talk about the multilateral fora, the, the possibility for plurilateral agreements on some of these technology issues that will help business uh, to expand and help standards be set so that the businesses understand the rules of the road. Where decoupling does happen is where the US government or the Chinese government puts in place rules uh, or, or regulations that inhibit 
um, the ability of our businesses to work in one another's markets. And so these are challenging issues when, it's, when, it, when we're talking about the technology sector. But I do think uh, from Washington, I'm seeing a, a real deliberation over how to grapple with these challenges in a more productive way. So I want to remind people to type your questions into the Q&A. You'll see a Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions, please go ahead and type them in. We'll try to get to them. Um, in the meantime, a quick question, follow-up question for you, Dr. Wong. You know, Amy is talking about the United States kind of re-engaging in the global conversation and in global institutions, all that kind of stuff. Does China, do you think, see that as encouraging or does China feel increasingly boxed in by that development? Well, I think I, I think I, I think that uh, uh, I think public China is actually seeing this as a positive. We we need <laughs> we need all the stakeholders of the major countries comes back. I mean, if if U.S. is is quit the WHO, if U.S. is uh, is threatening WTO, and you know or create the TPP, it's not a really a good good sign. So so that's why China uh, actually uh, applied to official applied to join CPTPP, and also you know we want to strengthen those regional and multilateral. Uh, institutions, of course, uh, uh, U.S. also threatened at uh, one time uh, uh, create the Paris uh, Climate Change Agreement. So, so I'm glad to see President Biden is coming back on those things. So let's talk. I mean, let's have more multi-channels, multilateral platform to talk and to meet G20. And uh, maybe G20 should add another one, G21. You know, uh, 21st we have African Union be added to the G20. So let's really talk about developing countries and the global issues. And that's where US and China can work together, I think, rather than really the two uh, really uh, fight with each other and all the you know, two elephant fight and all the, all the grasses suffer. So, so I think it's really important uh, that uh, both China, US and EU also that join together on those multilateral platform. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that on the WTO uh, minister meeting coming up, uh, you know, that we really solve some issue for WTO so that we really uh, say the global trade and investment continues, and that really gives a good hope to the business community and also to the stability of the world. And, and also WHO, how we can issue a vaccine passport, you know, get the people, uh, you know, mobility up and, uh, and have a way to let, let the people move around, but at the same time, uh, keep the uh, pandemic at bay. I mean, that's really top number one issue for WHO, and the US and China should work on that. Um, so a final question for both of you is about where areas where the United States and China can collaborate. I wonder, are climate and the green economy areas where the two countries can achieve more by working together and can, can companies work together on these issues? Want to jump in, Amy? Well, companies absolutely want to work on these issues. As you suggest, Inda, this is, an, as Dr. Wong mentioned a few minutes ago, this is an area ripe for enhanced cooperation. And it does take advantage of American uh, innovative leadership in R&D and China's incredible progress and innovation in these areas as well. And so I do think this is one area where obviously the US and China should be working and actually hopefully not just talking, but, but achieving common cause. And that is on climate change issues, since we're seeing the ramifications of climate change in, in the floods in the United States, the floods in China. I mean, these are incredibly important areas where our interests absolutely overlap and intersect. So that's one area. I do think that there are other areas where we have to enhance, return to enhancing uh, cooperation and coordination. Our diplomatic presence in one another's countries, we need to rebuild that. We need to make sure that educational exchanges continue in both of our countries because that's the foundation for this trust um, that we need to rebuild between our two countries and the peoples of our two countries. And then finally, um, for the business community and for all of us, I think that there are real opportunities to continue to open up uh, trade and investment dialogue between our two countries. And so I think these are, are, are they're all three of them. Uh, there are challenging issues in, in these platforms, um, but these are worthy of our time. When we know we face a very competitive, uh, challenging relationship between the US and China, there are some areas where we will continue to strongly disagree with one another. We need these areas of cooperation 
to balance um, this, uh, this challenging environment, which we are going to see continue into 2022 because of the domestic politics you raised in, the, mm -hmm. in both countries. That's a great point. Um, well, okay, so Dr. Wong, yeah, what do you, what do you think about uh, opportunities for collaboration and in particular the green, the green economy sector? Yeah, I, I think there's enormous uh, 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 opportunities uh, uh, between China and the US to collaborate. Uh, just, you know, Amy mentioned about this climate change. I mean, it, it, that's really true. You know, <laughs> we are seeing a great transformation going on that's going to generate the trillions of the trillions of dollars of business. And then it's new technology, clean energy, you know, uh, solar power, wind power, and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, new, new technology applied in all, all walks of life. Digital economy already uh, counts about the 40, 30, 40% 40 of Chinese GDP. Those areas that we can collaborate. So absolutely, uh, climate change is the number one uh, uh, priority. And both countries has consensus. President Xi already mentioned bef before 2030, not by, before 2030, and before 2060. Not buy, so so there could be ahead of schedule. So I think that is really uh, enormous opportunity generated for both China and the U.S. and the rest of the world. Second, I think infrastructure. That's the also low hanging fruit that all the countries in the world realize. Uh, infrastructure is crumbling, and uh, the world needs to really upgrade on that. China actually did a, a, a first uh, on that, had a little advantage of, uh, on that. Let's collaborate. Let's let's upgrade the World Bank, AIB, and all work together. Thirdly, I think uh, education, people-to-people -people exchanges, student exchanges. I'm glad to see uh, 100 to 200,000 Chinese students went back to the United States to study, to, even during the pandemic. That's great. We hope more U.S. students can come to China. And finally, I hope, I hope the tourism is really going to boom again. You know, after pandemic, we seem, want to see more traffic. I was uh, just uh, at uh, uh, Universal Studio in Beijing. It's enormous, uh, you know, mountain people, mountain people see if you use a Chinese word for that. It's enormous packed. Uh, so good business for, for the U.S. company. So, so let, and also the largest uh, uh, Universal Studio in the world out of the five they have in other countries and the U.S. So, so I think there's enormous opportunities and let's really work together for, for, for the sake of uh, both countries' benefit and for the mankind. So you know what there's I'm going to take because I want to establish a precedent of taking some questions so a couple questions just popped in I urge you all in the future to type your questions sooner, but I'm going to take one question from one Catherine Tai. so I'm assuming it's not that Catherine Tai, but another Catherine Tai. Um, but it's about the Belt and Road and it's for Dr. Wong so basically we know that, uh, you know, Countries need infrastructure, infrastructure to continue growing, et, et cetera. Um, but there's been a lot of concern, uh, pushback from recipient countries because of governance issues and lack of engagement of local stakeholders. So, Dr. Wong, what do you think BRI, BRI will evolve to, and how do you keep it clean and open in the future, uh, in future BRI projects? I think that exactly. That's a, that's a great question. I, I think what can be done is that, of course, China has actually helped to set up this AIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It has 104 countries in it. It modeled on the World Bank. It's actually doing a lot of uh, green and clean and, and, and lean project. It's, it's great. Let's involve AIB. Let's involve World Bank. Let's have international uh, uh, infrastructure bank consortia. And let China and the US you know, be a big, big stakeholder of that. I mean, we can work together. So, so if there's anything to be improved, let's, let's, let's get the international community to join in and, and work on that. So China, of course, is not perfect, cannot take in everything <laughs> on its own. We need international cooperation. So, so let's have a big uh, uh, you know, pie to work with uh, uh, both major countries so that we can really find some common interest to work on rather than we are obsessed with the, uh, you know, fighting with each other and uh, block each other and, and, and really getting us into no good. So I think there's a lot of room for uh, international uh, community to come in and work together China. and China welcomes that. Terrific, terrific. And we're going to hear a lot more about that tomorrow from Ma Jun, who, as you know, is China's top green finance thinker and has done a lot of work on uh, governance issues for the Belt and Road projects going forward. So tune in tomorrow. So that's all we have time for right now. Please, again, type your questions earlier so we can get to them faster. Um, a couple of things to just thank you both for. One is, I think, Henry, you know, our slogan for the whole conference is going to be let's talk. You know, you said, let's talk. And that is really our mission here. So thank you for that. I also loved your talking about two elephants fighting and all the grass suffers. Um, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to keep in mind. And um, 
you know, Amy, thank you so much for sharing thoughts on, on how the stakeholders need to come together and need to work together. So uh, thank you both so much for helping set the stage for this uh, for this entire conference and for um, addressing some very challenging issues. We're gonna be striving to pra find practical ways to navigate these very challenging times. So again, let's talk. And thank you so much for doing some great talking this morning. Um, thank you so much. So I'm now thrilled to, um, to bring on one of the leading investors in China Fred Hu of Primavera Capital. So Fred, um, you can come on the stage and Amy and Dr. Wong, thank you again so, so very much for that fantastic thank conversation. Um, we have Fred Hu of Primavera Capital, who's advised government leaders in both China and the United States for many, many years and manages many billions of dollars. So joining Fred in conversation is Adi Ignatius, who's the editor-in-chief of Harvard Business Review and who also happens to be my husband. So um, welcome both of you. I'm gonna hand it over to you, Adi, thank you. Uh, that's great, Dinda, thank you. And Fred, it's wonderful to see you. Um, I think, um, let, let me just make sure, can people hear me? I'm, I'm, Fred, can you hear me okay? Yes, you're good, you're good. All right, good, I, uh, I'm having a speaker problem, okay. So Fred, I wanna just sort of dive right in on the issue that I think is paramount to outsiders who are looking at China and, and to investors. I think there's concern now that, um, that China's recent moves to impose more state control on various sectors of the economy are adding up to something and we're not quite sure what it is. And, and I'm talking about the suspension of the Ant Group IPO, the banning of the Didi Chuxing app after its IPO, the banning of for-profit uh, educational tutoring companies in the K-12 space, new anti-monopoly regulations. It, this seems to add up to, to more state control over some key sectors of the economy. So I guess my first question to you, Fred, is, you know, do you share these concerns? You know, are these, and are these measures having a negative effect on the overall business environment? First of all, thank you, Dinda, for um, <clears throat> organizing this uh, wonderful conference and uh, <clears throat> wonderful to see you, uh, Adi. Um, yeah, um, on the um what's happened in china for the last um you know uh 12 months or so i think beginning with the, the um stunning uh suspension of the end ipo and especially over the last couple of months uh the chinese government has um um significantly stayed up um regulatory actions um targeting uh china's um, uh tech sector, uh, as you pointed out, you know, from fintech to e-commerce, um, from food delivery to uh, right heading, um, from social media to gaming, and uh, especially uh, uh, edtech, uh, those after school online tutoring uh, platforms. Um, and those actions uh, came with well, little at once, um, you know, warnings. So the markets clearly uh, were caught by surprise and there's tremendous um, confusion and even fear. And uh, as a result, uh, overseas list uh, Chinese tech companies, you know, those uh, listed in Hong Kong and the US, you know, lost over 1 trillion uh, US dollars in, uh, in value. So clearly there's, um, very significant uh, short-term uh, impact. However, I, I wouldn't go uh, as far as, um, you know, cross the board uh, increase uh, in state control. Um, you know, the confusion and the surprise aside, if one um, look more closely, you know, why what China has been doing, what they're doing, um, actually, there are um, some pretty um, understandable uh, intentions and the goals uh, for those actions, because you know China uh, has nurtured uh, one of the biggest, uh, most uh, vibrant uh, you know digital ecosystems, and as many of the tech platforms are getting very big the influence on the economy and the society 
you know, has become um, very significant. So naturally, th there are uh, concerns about um, issues such as possible abuse of market power or under competitive behavior, uh, issues like uh, data security, and um, you know, also uh, issues around in consumer uh, privacy, you know, user rights and so on and so forth. So as you can see, Adi, these are by no means unique uh, Chinese concerns. You know, there are uh, really global concerns and the European Union uh, has actually, you know, leading the way, uh, has been leading the way in scrutinizing the big tech. And uh, in China, you know, China has stepped up, uh, you know, since uh, October last year. Uh, I suspect even the US uh, and the Biden administration may also start to become more proactive uh, on the tech front. So these are the, the, the global uh, uh, similarities. But of course, there are also, you and I know, there are, you know, uh, since specific to China, uh, you know, you know, unique uh, governance, you know, system. So, you know, there are not many in, um, Debate and uh, you know uh, a process, so uh, so you know the decisions are made made very quickly, and the enforcement has been very swift. Um, and also, I think the communications could have been better. Uh, so for all this, that uh, yeah, you know, my view is that yes, in the short term, uh, you know, the regulatory enforcement uh, and actions against tax sector in particular. You know, have caused uh, considerable, you know, uh, confusion and uh, and 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 the fear. Uh, so there are some short-term uh, damages, but I think the uh, you know underlying uh, media long-term structural um, uh, trends remain intact. You know, China remains uh, uh, a very good place uh, to do business or or for uh, investors. So I, I think you you said it just right, Fred. That um, that you can explain all of these measures, um, but at the same time they've come as a surprise. So, and as you say, we don't see the 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 kind of debate that goes into these measures. We just see what you know the the actions themselves. So, I, I guess my question is, you know, every foreign company that invests in China is thinking about their risk position in a different way now with some of these measures. Uh, and trying to figure out, you know, is, is is our sector next? Because these things, they may be logical. Uh, we may be able to interpret them after the fact, but they do come as a surprise. So what would you say to foreign investors who are trying to understand, you know, are, are, do we now face greater risk or how do we understand if our sector is is going to be, you know, regulated in some new way or, or you know, how would you how would you describe that? Well, I would say doing business in any jurisdiction, uh, you know, regulatory uncertainty, uh, you know, risks are always, uh, uh, you know, a big part of the decision-making process. And, uh, you know, China is not new, you know, to a lot of foreign uh, investors or businesses, right? You know, many of them have been operating in China from day one, you know, when China opened up and the last 20 plus years since China's accession to WTO, you know, Virtually most of the Fortune Global 500 countries we can think of, <laughs> you know, have built a significant presence uh, in China, and uh, so you know they have been able to navigate uh, pretty successfully uh, of China's unique, uh, you know, social governance or regulatory systems. And I should also say, you know, by and large, China has been uh, very uh, investor friendly, uh, especially towards foreign uh, uh, investors. Um, but uh, I've said that, you know, regulations, um, you know, uh, are, are, are part of the concern. And uh, what's been happening of last 12 months, you know, is more uh, uh, narrow, focused on the uh, consumer internet sector. And uh, in this space, uh, actually it's one of the few exceptions where uh, foreign presence uh, is uh, insignificant, uh, I might say. Um, but in other parts of the economy, uh, you know, consumer sector, you know, manufacturing, you know, um, medicine, 
uh, and you, you name it, you know, they, they're very, very strong uh, foreign presence. And uh, there's no sign that uh, the government is going to take on uh, those sectors. Um, for people who are viewing this, um, I'll try to get to some audience questions at the end. So please put them into the, uh, the, uh, the, the chat box, into the Q&A. Um, well, Fred, let me, let me ask this then. So, you know, if, if there is increased risk in certain sectors, how is this, you know, is it, are you changing your own portfolio in terms of, of what you invest in? Have you made some shifts based on, you know, what you're seeing in terms of, of the state's response to certain sectors? Well, you know, as I said earlier, um, what's been happening appears to be really uh, concentrated uh, on the consumer internet sector uh, and especially ad tech. Uh, so that I would say, you know, until things really uh, does the settles down, you know, I think there's uh, significant uh, risks and uncertainty uh, for investors. Um, but, you know, China is a continental uh, economy, besides the economy. So there are many other industries and sectors, um, not only open uh, to investors, but also actually, you know, quite attractive uh, uh, as, uh, as investment destinations. Um, just to give you a few examples, you know, in the, you know, industrial tech, uh, you know, manufacturing, automation, um, you know, robotics, um, and you know, medicine, I mentioned that including you know, pharmaceuticals, you know, medical devices. Um, and uh, in particular, which I think you know, the, the earlier panel talked about is the climate uh, uh, tech, you know, um, renewable energy, uh, electrical vehicles, uh, next gen batteries, uh, those sectors are you know, China clearly is a leading play uh, globally. A uh, lot of exciting stuff is happening, you know, innovation, uh, technology, uh, new business models uh, emerging uh, in China, you know, virtually every day. And the government, you know, has been ambiguously uh, supportive uh, of those, uh, you know, the so-called green, uh, green sector, you know, decarbonization of the economy. So, you know, I would say there's very little, if any, uh, regulatory uh, risks. Uh, so, yeah, so the, 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 the bottom line is the, uh, the Chinese economy is so big. Um, you know, there are, you know, many, many industries and the sectors uh, that are very, very attractive to uh, global investors. And in, in, in a macroeconomic level, you know, I saw that the IMF lowered slightly its prognosis for China's growth, but it's still, you know, as high as anywhere in the world. Are you are you generally confident and bullish about the overall Chinese economy, you know, growing quickly and, and maybe pulling up the rest of the world as it does? Yes, you know, China has come a long way, you know, from a low income economy to now a high middle income uh, country but there's still significant untapped growth potential out there. You know, this ongoing uh, middle-class, you know, consumer story, uh, the innovation story we talk about, you know, uh, everything, you know, from um, artificial intelligence to, um, you know, green technologies. And, um, um, you know, so, so there's still huge scope for, uh, efficiency, you know, productivity growth. So, you know, Chinese economy in, over middle long term, you know, can uh, maintain still, you know, quite the uh, uh, rapid uh, rate of growth, you know, granted, not like double digit, you know, we have got the cotton to see uh, in, in the past, but, you know, given adjusting for the, uh, the capital income level, China, I, I said, is, is much higher than uh, it was before. So, uh, but it's still very, very uh, 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 strong growth performance. Uh, the short term though, you know, uh, because of COVID, you know, last year China uh, had a, probably the lowest uh, rate of growth on record. Uh, although ironically China was the first in first out, you know, uh, actually leading the global uh, recovery uh, post the pandemic. 
So the recovery momentum uh, uh, appears uh, uh, strong, although you know in the short term there are some accidents as regards the uh, Delta outbreak and uh, you know when the country will reopen the border, you know the supply chain issues, you know inflation. These are you know global um, issues uh, 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 or facing global economy at large. So China, you know, uh, being the second largest, you know, obviously uh, immune. Uh, to those issues, but I do see, um, you know, China will be able to overcome uh, these short-term issues and maintain uh, significant, uh, you know, strong growth uh, over medium long term. So I, I do want to ask you though about debt, China's domestic debt. Um, it's something yeah. a lot of us have been watching for a long time, and it really, the issue came into focus with what happened with Evergrande. Um, What's your sense now? Do you think the government can handle the debt problem, or is this going to be a challenge that will that'll be a tough one for the next next year or two or more? Yeah, the uh, debt uh, uh, problem clearly is very very challenging. Uh, it requires very careful um, handling uh, on the part of the government uh, and the financial system uh, as a whole. Um, but let's just stay back, okay? You know, the, in part because of the, uh, uh, you know, as part of the policy response to the uh, pandemic, uh, so the debt uh, has risen, actually like elsewhere in the world, right? So, you know, as uh, at this moment, uh, debt to GDP uh, ratio, you know, stands at uh, around 290% of GDP. So that's high than it was uh, before uh, a year ago. Um, but just to put into perspective, so that's comparable to the debt level in the US, you know, uh, around 296% of GDP. And also in the, the European Union uh, on average, year. and actually still significantly lower than that in Japan. At over four hundred percent of GDP, so that's as a first time when you read the headlines, right? That China has a big debt problem. You know, is really China uniquely <laughs> uh, has a debt problem? In the answer is no, right? That's very similar to the other larger uh, economies, um, and the debt structure is different, of course. You know, in the US, in Japan, and the Europe, the government sector, you know, actually accounts for the uh, big part of the, the debt uh, uh, stock. Whereas in China, uh, is the corporate sector that has the highest uh, leverage ratio. So Ever, Evergrande is the most notorious uh, example. Um, but, um, you know, I would say, you know, uh, it's challenging uh, and, uh, you know, people have to be uh, vigilant uh, against what this means and how this is going to play out, right? You know, to be a good risk manager. Um, but in aggregate or specifically, uh, those issues can be dealt with, uh, you know, again, through a marked uh, approach, um, you know, reorganization, rescheduling, uh, or, you know, in case of bankruptcy. So the government has to strike a very uh, delicate balance uh, you don't want to cause a panic by, uh, with the disorderly, messy uh, defaults and uh, you know, bankruptcies that cause a lot of pa panic. Uh, but also you should not just bail out uh, those uh, highly indebted uh, you know, businesses and uh, you know, uh, causing a moral hazard, which will um, you know, cause problems you know, down the road. Um, so it's still early days. We don't know how exactly this go play out, but I, you know, just judging uh, from the past experience when China had to deal, with, you know, such a uh, problems, um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm cautiously uh, hopeful um, that the problem can be uh, uh, contained. Um, one thing that is confusing to outsiders is. Um, the kind of almost neo-Maoist rhetoric that, that you hear in China now. Uh, and it almost feels like symbolically, at least, there's almost a step back toward Maoism. Can you help 
explain that or, or or maybe my question is how do you how do you interpret that how do you analyze that what does that mean overall for china well you know i i sometimes i scratch my head <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, by some of the the, 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 the the rhetoric i don't know what they mean exactly or what the intentions are um you know in the media maybe ideology uh, uh, uh arena especially um however i feel pretty relaxed. You know, China has uh, come such a long way. Um, and, um, you know, cultural revolution, you know, for my generation and others, you know, still, um, you know, is um, very much uh, in our mind. Um, I think Chinese society has changed. Um, you know, reform, open up, you know, have really benefited vast majority of Chinese people. Uh, there's no appetite for Chinese people and the society uh, to go back to the old days, uh, like 40 years ago. Um, so I just don't see even why uh, anyone want to go back because I see that most people have benefited from a new China of the last 40 years of uh, market reforms, uh, you know, uh, deep integration uh, with the global economy. Um, so therefore, I'm uh, as baffled as I am as anyone. I'm pretty, um, um, I wouldn't say relaxed. I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm very confident that the China will stay course of uh, reform and the continued uh, opening uh, to the global uh, system because that's the proven formula of success uh, for China. And just simply there's no other way. And, the, and I, I just see no appetite uh, you know, uh, going any other way. So the time has gone more quickly than I thought it would, but I, there's one more question I wanna ask you before we, we, uh, we have to stop. And the previous panel talked about decoupling and it was more from a, a kind of policy perspective. And I'm interested in your thoughts on decoupling from an investment perspective. I mean, do you, is decoupling a, a, a risk that is out there and you have to plan for that? Or do you think the two countries, US and China are so intertwined economically and financially that it's not a, a serious risk? Yeah, you know, it's clearly US and China uh, have been so, um, into one, and I would say, you know, high degree of uh, mutual dependency. You know, that's really, really good for both countries. Um, decoupling, you know, is only um, a risk if politicians, you know, really push to make it happen, right? There's no rational reason why decoupling serves, you know, each country better or the world better. In fact, you know, decoupling is lose-lose and also take the world economy you know, as a collateral damage. So I think it's a really damn idea and it's dangerous uh, notion. You know, when we decouple each other economically, you know, trade uh, and financially, you know, in terms of, you know, cross-border investments, actually, you know, each country will have high risk of national security and all that. And I think global peace and stability will be jeopardized. So I think it's a terrible idea. It's a dangerous idea, you know, I hope politicians on both sides, you know, will be wise enough to come to their sense not to do that. All right, well, Fred, thank you. I, I think we're out of time and, and uh, well, there's my wife, didn't it? Um, so, <laughs> that was, yeah, she's back. So anyway, thank you, thank you for that. And that was, uh, as always, it's just, it's great to hear your views on, on, uh, on, on China and the investment environment. Good to talk to you. Yeah, thank you for that. That um, really, um, uh, you know, honest and serious assessment of what's going on, and uh, the historical perspective is so so helpful, Fred. Um, and the idea that decoupling is a terrible idea and a dangerous idea. Is, I think that those are words that will stick in our minds um, throughout today and tomorrow. So thank you so much, both of you. Um, we're now going to take a look at the macro picture in China uh, with three top economists 
discussing reforms and what they see both in terms of policy and on the ground reality. Um, again, there's a lot of concern these days, especially in the West about recent moves to exert more government controls, as Adi and Fred were talking about just now, over the business sector. So there are lots of questions that um, we need to address, and we have a great team of, of experts to help us answer them. So Huang Yiping, Yiping Huang, is the department chair, deputy dean, and professor of finance and economics at the National School of Development at Peking University. And Professor Huang has helped lead much of China's work on financial reforms. Uh, Fan He, is Professor of Anti-College of Economics and Management at Jiao Tong University and Chief Economist at, at Entropy Capital, which is a global macro hedge fund based in Shanghai. And he, I will add that he's also a hugely popular commentator on Chinese economic issues in China. Dan Rosen is a leading thinker on China and founding partner of the Rhodium Group, which has just launched a new initiative called Pathfinder, which tracks China's reforms. Uh, and our moderator, Steve Markscheid, is a longtime China hand. He opened Chase Bank's office in Beijing in 1983, was it? 84. Okay, 84. You're muted still. Uh, and uh, Steve is chairman of Stillwater's Green Technology. So um, happy to have you all with us today. Thank you so much. And over to you, Steve. I'm going to disappear. Uh, thanks, Linda. And thank you, the China Institute, for uh, organizing this very interesting program. Uh, so just to set the stage, uh, you know, it seems to me that since Deng Xiaoping initiated China's policy of reform and opening over 40 years ago, China has enjoyed spectacular economic growth, lifting close to a billion people out of poverty. And coincidentally, this period coincides with my own China-focused business career. I think that much of this success was due to the government reducing and relinquishing its control over economic enterprise and thus unleashing Chinese entrepreneurs. Uh, the, the expression that we use is a minjing guotui, that the private sector advances and the state sector recedes. And this was especially prominent during the uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao era. Uh, in 2013, uh, the World Bank published a study, China 2030, uh, which laid out six strategic directions for further economic and financial reforms. Uh, recently, it seems to outside observers that under Xi Jinping, government policy has moved in the opposite direction. So I was pretty interested to read uh, the Pathfinder report that Dinda referred to, which is published by uh, Rhodium Group and the Atlantic Council, uh, which reports that while still not ideal and falling short of developed country standards, China continues on its path of reform. So that's encouraging. Now, on the other hand, Dan Rosen also just published a piece in foreign policy about how the economic reforms have failed. So when we think about economic reforms, we're usually talking about deregulation. Uh, many people are concerned that deregulation has slowed or reversed, especially as described by previous sessions in recent months. So the question for all the panelists is, how do you gauge the achievements of China's economic reforms during the Xi Jinping era? And I'd like to start with Dan because he's got these two publications out there, which on the face of it, you know, seem to have a certain amount of contradiction. So I hope that he can reconcile that for us. Steve, thank you so much. And it's such a delight to be here uh, for, with the group um, today. Um, so uh, let's wade into that a little bit um, and, and try to resolve the Maodun, the contradictions uh, that you, 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 you find in, in the pieces you refer to. I think the Xi, the Xi years, the Xi era overall should indeed be uh, acknowledged as a, a time of strong attempts to take the next lap around the track of market reform, uh, to try to get a lot of things done. Um, starting right from the beginning of the year of 2013 was really a watershed year and acknowledging the work to be done. And I would extend your, your, your setup a little bit and say that much of the work was not just uh, the rise of the regulatory state and sort of re-regulating for the next stage, but there were still a tremendous array of the deep structural reform work that was needed, right, um, to make the leap from development stage at very low income levels um, to the kind of challenges of a more uh, middle income uh, advanced economy uh, that China was moving into. So, so from the beginning, we, we saw uh, really serious efforts to uh, resolve the inefficiencies in the interbank market and the role that was playing in loading up uh, the principally the corporate sector, as Fred who uh, noted, 
but also ultimately households um, with debt, recognizing in that year that if that was not resolved then, it would create debt bombs, time bombs, tra traps for the future. Um, so that was um, commenced. Uh, a few years later, um, a demonstrable effort to open up the capital account and let Chinese companies go global in defense of their ability to export in order to get a more balanced balance, uh, BOP, balance of payment situation, and otherwise normalize China, globalize China financially, not just in trade terms and in terms of one-way flows of technology and, and expat skills like you brought, Steve, um, when you went to China uh, to start your uh, your modern career. Renminbi internationalization was another un, uh, unstarted um, process that happened um, uh, mid uh, Xi era thus far and was profoundly important structural move. Corporate governance uh, modernization, moving beyond the predominance of party committees and looking after all the major strategic decisions companies made and instead putting independent boards of directors uh, and uh, giving boards responsibility um, for key profit-oriented uh, decision-making. Equity market normalization, uh, finally allowing other asset classes than property to be the sponge, the absorber of people's net life savings so that it doesn't, didn't go predominantly just into one asset class uh, property. Um, uh, Foreign direct investment normalization. China had set the standard for developing countries in terms of in terms of openness to foreign direct investment, um, but still had a long way to go to be uh, as liberal toward FDI foreign direct investment as a typical advanced uh, uh, open market economy um, such as France or Italy or something like that. Um, private sector empowerment taking the reins off of innovative private companies that were creating all the new marginal taxes, all the new marginal employment, and were the sunrise industries of the future, especially in technology. So all of these and other uh, core uh, marketization reform and opening policies were started. Um, Xi Jinping himself took responsibility for all of the leadership groups um, that would bear, you know, uh, bear responsibility, that would take credit or bear responsibility if they were not successfully um, enacted. And he signed off on them and they were all begun. But all of those and others encountered unanticipated stability issues in the course of implementation um, that were clearly not things that had been fully thought through and planned for. And I say that with confidence because in all those cases and the others I have in mind as well, the reform process was suspended, delayed, um, or otherwise curtailed such that the um, objective uh, of the reforms in the first place um, was not met. Whether it was center local fiscal reform that uh, reduced the over-reliance of local governments on land sales, um, either to property developers or to uh, commercial uh, heavy in industry uh, manufacturers, uh, regardless of demand in China for what they made, for example, steel for, uh, or aluminum, something like that. Right? And of course, heavy industry and property were, were hev heavily related there as well. So none of those things actually got finished. I hesitate to, to say full-throatedly that everything failed because in all advanced economies, there were a lot of false starts and um, unsuccessful first attempts to get these sorts of things done over the past 150 years. Um, but it was acknowledged that the work remained to be done, that everything was not on track and going smoothly such as the party has asserted over the past several years that nothing actually um, had, uh, had come off the rails at all. And so what we could have at first a few years ago called simply a delay, given the lack of acknowledgement, the insistence that nothing went awry, and now layer on top of that, the discordant signals with regard to the role of the market versus the role of the party and the state <laughs> and the sort of mixed message that entrepreneurs should be, yes, profitable, but they should also be patriots first, right? And that this way lies the efficiency and the future opportunity of China gives us great pause as to the course we're on right now and what it means for the future. That um, I'll st stop by noting that um, for um, want of the kind of productivity that market <laughs> reform opens up, 
the nation and the economy have had to fall back on that same reliance, over-reliance on the property sector, making up somewhere between 20 and 30% of all GDP today. It's a, a right, quite historically unprecedented, right? As an engine of growth, if it wanted to continue announcing that it was achieving, say, 5 6 7% GDP growth. And so that's what it did. And it has created a, uh, a situation in the property sector and debt in general um, from which there is no elegant, um, uh, safe, uh, manageable exit now. And we move into a phase that's quite uncharted uh, and we'll see where it takes us. Let me stop there and I'm excited about the rest of the discussion. Well, Dan, that's great. That's very provocative and uh, you know, and then timely given the Evergrande situation just now. You know, I'm thinking, uh, Professor Huang, uh, I, I'd like you to comment uh, on what Dan said, whether you concur uh, with his evaluation and also how you see the financial market opening up further as we go forward. Right. Um, well, thanks for the question. Um, the first point I'd like to make, um, just to put things in perspective, understanding what is going on in China. It's important to remember that we have a gradual reform approach. So as an economist watching economic reform in China for the past four decades, I must say almost at every point of time when I looked at the policy, um, some, to some extent I felt like unsatisfied. But the nature of gradual re reform means it's always goes slowly. And sometimes it even takes a step back. But if you look back like the next, the, 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 the past five, 10, 20 years, you still saw significant um, going forward. So this is why my suggestion is sometimes we see reform slowing either because there are some different ideas about the division of labor between the state and, uh, and the market, or because of the, the need to balance between reform, structure change, and, uh, um, and, and stability. So these are the issues I think we all need to keep in mind. Over longer term, I'm pretty confident that we're still moving in the same direction. Although there is an open question, what is the ultimate optimal um, model for the Chinese economy? Is that best model that without any government intervention or there should be a proper division of labor between the market and the state? That's my uh, first uh, point. Um, with regard to the financial sector, I think that things are probably much more clear cut. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we're facing in the financial sector is that it looks like uh, the, finance, the financial support to real economic growth really weakened during the past years. And my own take is because the economy enters into a new development stage. If China used to rely on input driven growth, now we have to rely on innovation growth, uh, driven growth, which basically means the new challenge is can the financial sector really innovate itself in facilitating or supporting economic innovation? That is the biggest challenge we are, we are seeing at the moment. There are three things, have, at least the three things are happening. And I think these are the things important for us to recognize. Number one is financial innovation is a very widespread. And one thing that I've been spending lots of time studying um, during the past couple of years is this, this so-called digital finance. The big tech companies rely on the platform and the bigger data to extend lots of loans to SMEs that these are never covered by the banks. But basically they innovated and created new ways of accessing to the customers and assessing their financial risks. This was a big achievement in my view and a very positive in supporting the SMEs and the private enterprises. The second thing which was also quite apparent, I think to most of your audience uh, viewers is financial opening is really pushing ahead. Um, people wondering whether China is turning inward looking or outward looking, but you're looking at the financial sector, there are a number of measures implemented during the past years, reducing the restrictions of foreign stakes, issuing new licenses for foreign financial institutions and so on. And one of the biggest tasks for the 14 to five year plan period is to uh, prudently pushing ahead internationalization of the currency. If that's the case, 
then we have to we should expect the further opening of the financial market probably also also further liberalization of the capital account that's the second thing which i think is a very encouraging now even though china the, the the policymakers are talking about more reliance on domestic demand in driving economic growth but uh, integration into the foreign financial system uh, which will, will remains a key policy priority the third thing which is also happening and sometimes people feel like uh, this is what the, the government is trying to control the financial sector. But in my view, most of these actions are related to rebuilding and improving the regulatory system. So for instance, taking the, the, the digital finance as an example, it was doing well, but it was not properly regulated. And, and, and that's why we saw a lot of big problems. Now the government is taking actions to bring all these under regulatory framework. And I think the same is happening for the entire financial system. China used to rely on government guarantee in maintaining financial stability. That was effective for some time, that, but you cannot rely on that forever. So that's why I think you see different regulatory bodies uh, putting into place the new measures um, in uh, regulation. Sometimes people might regard that as a new way of control. Um, I think there is a risk there, but I think the most of the things the regulators are doing are what is necessary for maintaining a healthy financial system and strongly supporting um, uh, economic innovation. Well, Professor Huang, that's that's really enlightening, and it's it's interesting to me in particular because you know just as China is starting to. Uh, uh, take action against the power of big tech. So in the United States, when you talk about uh, uh, digital finance, we see the new SEC chairman, Gary Gensler, uh, coming out quite aggressively uh, for the regulation of cryptocurrencies. So I think there's parallel pressures in both, uh, both countries. So turning to Professor He, you know, I'd like your comments so far. And also, you know, aside from uh, the first tier cities that we're most familiar with, um, yeah. you see that uh, certain areas may be loosening. So I'd like your perspective on that, if you could. Um, thank you, uh, Stephen, for your question. But um, I have to say, uh, when we talk about uh, reform, uh, we no longer talking about the deregulation. And uh, quite frankly, I'm not sure whether it's a good idea, even for the West, after the global financial crisis, you still put uh, so much emphasis on deregulation. So more and more Chinese policymaker and a Chinese scholar, when we're talking about economic reform in China, we, we, we talk more about innovation and the transformation. So innovation um, related with the upgrading of China's manufacturing sector and uh, transformation. Uh, one thing is the further development of the service sector and also urbanization. And uh, these two factors are related with each other. And uh, um, come back to your question, what is happening uh, for the tier two city and uh, tier three city? Um, Many foreign friends, when they come to China, they mainly visited Beijing and Shanghai. Mm -hmm. So um, if you only visited Beijing, to some extent, you may become quite pessimistic because uh, tier one cities is now not the, uh, the have the fastest growth rate. In the last one decade, uh, those cities uh, which grow most fast is the inland cities like Chengdu in Sichuan and Zhengzhou in Henan and Hefei in Anhui. So all those uh, capitals of the inland provinces. And I see a quite interesting uh, coincidence uh, the re-emergency of uh, those uh, tier two cities and uh, a lot of those tier three uh, cities, small towns, county level cities. Uh, it started around the year 2008. So one is after, so because the, 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 the rapid development of the tier one city is related with globalization. 
But then after the global financial crisis, and also uh, with the four trillion stimulus package, and we can see the, in, the great improvement of infrastructure in the inland area. You can see the newly built road lead to very remote area, even to the villages. And also with the development of the e-commerce and our consumers in small towns, and even in villages, they have the same opportunity to get access to all the fancy goods on the platforms like Taobao and, uh, and Jingdong. And also uh, you can see that the uh, income level of those uh, uh, peoples in the, living in the small cities are increasing. And they are becoming more and more innovative in, in many ways. Um, I strongly encourage uh, foreign friends uh, when they visit China, they should come to those uh, more remote area to see what is happening there. If you ask the young uh, people in China, the younger generation in China, and they will tell you now the most popular singer are not from Beijing or Shanghai. They are from small towns like Haifeng uh, in Guangdong. And also my prediction is probably in the future, the most innovative uh, business model will emerge not uh, from the tier one city, but from the uh, small towns. And also you can see probably some athletic stars. There'll be more uh, baseball player and hockey player uh, and uh, football player. The, the best football player, hockey player in China is not in Beijing and Shanghai or Shenzhen. They are in the uh, unknown uh, remote small towns. Well, that's very interesting. And uh, Professor He, I appreciate your encouragement to visit the, the smaller cities. I hope that uh, soon the pandemic will recede and travel restrictions will lift and we'll be able to visit mm -hmm. China again. Uh, it's re I really like your point about it's not so much deregulation, but economic reform is stimulating mm -hmm. innovation and transformation. Because you know, mm -hmm. many economists are concerned that recent moves towards uh, state capitalism, greater party control over the economy is going to impede that innovation. Um, so uh, you know, I, I'd like to ask, is this a, a risk that we perceive that uh, innovation may be thwarted by increasing party control over private enterprises? Uh, uh, Dan, do you have a view on that? Uh, yeah, I think, um... As I noted before, there, there's sort of a dual mandate being handed to entrepreneurs, innovators, innovation financers now to uh, pursue profitability. Because of course that profitability, it means the ability to service your debt. <laughs> Without it, all the patriotism in the world um, will not save your system. But at the same time that you're pursuing profitability, you're supposed to be considering all these political um, objectives, common prosperity, uh, is the most prominent uh, political campaign at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's very difficult uh, from the from uh, in the private sector right now, and all that all the innovation innovation companies that are being really turned upside down in terms of the basic assumptions that were uh, guiding their investment decisions. There are, there is a whole new set of incentives that has been presented to them, not so clearly in terms of what exactly they are supposed to do to be profitable, to be internationally competitive, and at the same time meet all these political objectives, will they be able to make the next investment uh, as successfully as they made their previous investments the past 10 years? As Professor Hu said, they've been very successful economically relative to say their state-owned enterprise cousins, but they did that with a singular profit motivation in mind. We don't know, we don't have any proof um, or basis to expect that saddled with the dual mandate of profitability and political um, objectives, they will be able to deliver um, anything like the same performance. I think we can say historically uh, that it's uh, virtually impossible that their purely financial economic performance will be as good as it was when they solely had a profit motive. We know that Professor Ho would agree with that and Yiping would as well. The question is how much less uh, productive will they be in pursuit of the, this dual mandate that that uh, they and then everyone else in the commercial sector is being uh, given today. Uh, if they can get close 
um, by making sure that you know services and digital and all these things, the, their purpose is now to support the real economy, not to be singular you know, um, engines of growth unto themselves for their own sake, right? Um, we'll see how close they can get to the kind of performance we've seen over the past decade. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, and I, I see echoes of that in the United States as well. You know, the whole Milton Friedman's idea that the only responsibility of the company was to the shareholders. And that uh, notion yep. has taken a hit as we move towards a more stakeholder view of economic development. Definitely. Um, it has. Yep. There definitely are parallels in the United States and Europe on almost all the things we're talking about. The question is just, how, you know, are we talking about tweaking 10% of the system or are we talking about ripping out 60% of the, the basic incentive structures and foundations of what has made growth work in the past, replacing it with something whole, wholly new. Uh, the latter is a much more difficult problem to manage than the former. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Professor Huang, uh, I'd like your insight on, on this very question. Well, I think uh, the, the thing to remember, is, uh, let, let's look at some numbers. Um, of the total patents um, created by the companies, 70% are by private enterprises, 25% by foreign investor companies, and 5% by state-owned companies. So I think the policymakers know um, these numbers. And you know, this is why recently the government is making so much effort trying to improve financial services to, to the SMEs. And most of the private enterprises are SMEs. So this is the basic fact. I think. Uh, if the SMEs and the private enterprises cannot advance um, like uh, what they did in the past, though, um, there will be a big problem of innovation um, in China. But at the same time, there is also an open question about the industrial policy, which is a very controversial, I understand, uh, between China and the US. What is the exact role that the government can play in facilitating innovation, not just creating innovation by the government itself or SOE itself, but the government can still do lots of things like investing in basic research, education, and support some of the innovation by reducing the barriers of um, entry. So for instance, um, in some areas, the industrial policy has been successful in the solar panels, in electrical cars, and, and so on. I think the government is also trying to make an effort in developing, advancing the chip industry. By the way, one of the reasons why the government now is, 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 is concentrated so much efforts in advancing its chip industry, not just the government, but also the, the enterprises themselves, is partly because of what happened in the US, because you ban exports of your high tech products to China. So there's no choice. The companies, the government, they all have to do it. But uh, I also recognize not all these industrial policies being successful. So I, I think I, mean, I would not want to overestimate the potential contribution of government supporting um, innovation itself. But a certain degree of industrial policy, I think is understandable. And my understanding is the Biden administration is also doing similar things. So, um, so in the end, I think there will be a, a balance. And at, at the number I mentioned, I'd like to say it again, private enterprises in China contribute 70% of the uh, patents in China. And I think everybody would recognize the importance of the, of the private sector. Yeah, I was going to make the same point about how for decades the United States has criticized China for its industrial policies and now is emulating them. So right. it's, it's a bit ironic. Uh, Dan mentioned uh, common prosperity. And, uh, you know, that's a buzzword that we're hearing a lot, uh, trying to uh, understand the next steps in reform. Uh, uh, Professor Ho, does it make sense to impose these sorts of changes from the top down? You've talked about the importance of the uh, uh, second, third, fourth tier cities. Is, is there a risk that trying to impose this from the top is going to be a disincentive for private sector investment? Um, let me share with you some of my personal experience. I used to live in Beijing for more than 10 years. So when I live in Beijing, and now I'm living in Shanghai and Shenzhen, uh, two cities. So when I live in Beijing, and I think a government policy is very important. And uh, now I'm living in Shenzhen and Shanghai, and I have a lot of, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneur uh, uh, friends. And then 
my observation is my observation is we tend to uh, overestimate the importance of government policy and we 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 tend to underestimate the power of the market and because china is a market economy um a very big market economy so even if one door is closed and then uh, those uh, entrepreneurs they will find some other ways and also uh, try to think it in a and in another way, we tend to assume that only private sector can be quite innovative. And who said that? Who said that the government cannot be very innovative? Um, let me give you one example. In recent years, especially after the, the COVID uh, the pandemic, and you can see that the government is using the uh, big data to uh, you know, to better management the uh, mobility of the people. And that's the one reason why China is so successful in in in, in curb the uh, pandemic. And uh, you can you can think about uh, uh, down the track in the future what might be the possibility if you put AI and the government together. And it's not the 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 kind of a thing the the. The, the, the old things like a big brother, big brother is watching you. Um, it's a totally new thing. It's probably big brother is serving you. Um, and that's quite amazing. On the one way, uh, when big brother is serving you and it will give you efficiency and convenience. And it, at the same time, you know that the reason that he can serve you is because he get all the data. I don't know whether this is a good thing or bad thing, but then it's a totally new thing. So it it will be a quite a challenge for social scientists to imagine that in the future, uh, what will be the uh, the uh, you know the, the the power of the technology, the new technology, uh, the influence on both the government and the and the market. Yeah, I think I think the United States is struggling with that as well. The power of the tech companies, and particularly the, the, the data. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, what about the uh, corruption in the Chinese system? This has uh, become a little bit more prominent since uh, Desmond Shun uh, published his book uh, *Red Roulette*. Uh, is it getting better? Uh, and how does uh, official corruption uh, impact reforms going forward? Uh, Professor Huang, do you have a view on that? I'm not an expert on, on, the, on the politics, um, but, uh, but certainly I see after Xi Jinping came to um, office, um, anti-corruption campaign was uh, one of his top policy priorities. And even during the past the National Day holiday, a number of ministerial level officials were brought down. So um, I can't have an ex accurate assessment of the impact on the reform, but certainly we are seeing lots of officials like uh, sent to the jail. That really means um, it's a very, very tough uh, campaign uh, trying to clean up uh, um, the, 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 the government. So I do think the efforts is, is, is quite uh, um, determined. And I certainly hope this will have a big impact on um, the, the behavior of the government. Professor Ho, do you have a view on that? Um, to be frank, I have some doubt on the uh, uh, authenticity of that book. Um, but then uh, I think it's well known that in the past, uh, the uh, corruption in China is quite rampant. And uh, as uh, Professor Huang has mentioned uh, in recent year, uh, because of the uh, anti-corruption campaign, the situation has been uh, greatly improved. But even that, uh, we have to admit that corruption the, uh, cannot be eliminated once for all. Uh, but then there's a rule of thumb. Uh, if everybody knows that there's corruption, and uh, probably corruption is not the big challenge for China, because if everybody knows uh, that's a problem, and then uh, probably this uh, problem will be, you know, uh, already uh, addressed, uh, and the government will become more experienced in dealing with those well-known risks. So the real risk is not 
uh, those everybody knows. The real risk is some unknown risk or underestimated uh, risk. So uh, I don't think corruption per se uh, is a big threat for Chinese economy right now. Right. Yeah, I think it was Donald Rumsfeld, the former U.S. Defense Secretary, talked about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, I, I think we have time for one question, and uh, uh, it's from uh, Shen Zhen Liao, uh, and it's uh, how does education in China change to address innovation and transformation? Uh, the previous uh, uh, discussion talked about the government cracking down on private educational tutoring companies. Uh, is there any connection? Uh, and this is mostly a question for Professor He, as um, we know that you pay quite attention to China's education, but we'd like to hear from all the speakers. So Professor He, maybe you could take this. Well, let me just share with you one story or uh, uh, anecdote, um, which may help you to understand the government policy. It's, uh, this story uh, uh, tells that uh, once there's a conference, so the 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 uh, education minister uh, was there, and also there's uh, those bosses on those uh, the 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 uh, online education companies. So one boss of this online education company he reported to the uh, education minister, and he said, "Mr. Minister, we have now already around uh, one hundred." Uh, uh, no, 10, uh, 100 million subscriber. And Mr. Minister said, well, that's quite impressive. And then this uh, boss uh, said that our goal is to rebuild an education system for China. So you can understand uh, is, is, uh, for the government policy, uh, they always think that the, the, those online education will be supplementary to the public education. But then for the capital, and they will say, well, because we are so powerful, so we have to occupy that, we have to seize the whole market. And that's probably one underlying reason why recently they have, the government have this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, new policy. Yeah, so that's analogous to going after the tech companies because the government wants access to the data they're collecting on individuals. Yeah, if for the uh, uh, IT uh, company uh, as Alibaba and uh, Tencent, and they have uh, collected uh, so many data uh, in some way, and th they should be viewed as utility because they are providing the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think that's all we have time for. Uh, this has been a very illuminating discussion for me personally, and I hope for the, the, uh, the audience as well. So uh, Professor Huang, uh, Professor He, and Dan, thank you so much for your insights, and I'll turn it back over to Linda. Thank you so much. I mean, one of the most interesting things to emerge from this conversation, I think, is the kind of unexpected parallels between what the United States is grappling with and what China is grappling with and uh, might be worth, you know, looking deeper into that. But thank you all so much for your candor and for your, uh, you know, adding for adding nuance to this, these very complicated issues that tend to be seen in sort of black and white uh, far too often. So thank you very, very much. Um, so it's, uh, there's been a lot of talk lately, as you all know, and these, uh, these experts referred to it as well, a lot of talk of late about China's property market. And so it is my pleasure to bring to the stage two leading Hong Kong-based analysts for a conversation about where that market is headed. Uh, Li Gong Liu is chief China economist at Citigroup in Hong Kong, and Andrew Collier is Managing Director and Founder of Orient Capital Research based in Hong Kong. Uh, Andrew also helped launch Bank of China's New York office 40 years ago. <laughs> um, our moderator is my colleague, Nina Huang, without whom this conference truly wouldn't be happening. So thank you, Nina, for all your amazing work. Uh, Nina is a strategic thinker and is trained as a journalist. And she was a news anchor and executive producer at Sinovision before coming to work at China Institute. So Nina, over to you, thanks. Thank you, Dinda. Um, so I see um, Andrew's camera is not turned on yet. Andrew, can you try to turn on your camera? Okay, great, awesome. Um, it's really a great honor to have two top-notch 
uh, analysts to talk about the real estate market, which is a very hot topic recently. Um, anyone who is following the news about China uh, must know the real estate developer Evergrande. It is in big, big trouble. Um, it has over 300 billion US dollars in liabilities and just in recent three weeks in this three coupon payments. Um, what's worse is what everybody thought this could just be a single event, then um, just within this week, there are two more real estate developers that had trouble paying back their debts. Um, so in this panel, um, I hope our panelists will not only talk about event grant itself, but also discuss the impact of real estate sector on um, macro economy in China. Um, so let's get started. Let's um, start from you, Li Gang. So far, the Chinese government hasn't really sent out any signal that is going to bail out Evergrande. But now there is um, fear of contagion in the market. What do you think is the end game for Evergrande? Thank you, Nina. Uh, thank you, uh, Dinda, for the invitation. Uh, it's great pleasure to be in the China Institute Forum again. Uh, Nina, you, you have raised a very important question. The markets would like to know. Uh, uh, in fact, I think uh, at this moment, uh, we could use uh, scenario uh, analysis to discuss the possibilities uh, of the eventual re resolution of uh, Evergrande. Uh, uh, in front of us, uh, perhaps uh, we could think about uh, three scenarios. Uh, the first one is just let uh, Evergrande uh, uh, go bankrupt. Uh, however, uh, the potential economic and the financial contagion could be very hard uh, for the government to bear. Uh, as you rightly uh, pointed out, uh, uh, if Evergrande were to go under the second largest uh, property company in China, then how about uh, the rest of the you know pack? Uh, you know, in in general, you know, China's property sector is highly leveraged. Uh, on average, a private property company has a debt to leverage uh, asset ratio at 83%. And so uh, indeed, uh, uh, we could see a significant uh, uh, contagion effect, uh, perhaps uh, driving down other uh, developers uh, as well, uh, because during the process, uh, banks may call back loans, uh, uh, you know, then, uh, you know, even those viables one uh, could go under. Um, so this is the, you know, uh, quite a significant economic and financial uh, impact the government may not be able to bear this moment. Uh, uh, in addition to that, I think there's a social consequences. So that is, uh, uh, we know at this moment, uh, two, uh, 2.5 million people uh, have bought uh, Evergrande pre-sale apartments. <laughs> they are waiting uh, their apartments to be to be delivered. If uh, uh, you know the Evergrande were to fail, you know people could not get their apartments, uh, so they will probably e engage in some kind of sit-in uh, protests in front of local government. Uh, in addition, you know cons construction workers uh, may not be. Uh, paid either. Uh, they are not happy. And also keep in mind, uh, uh, you know, Evergrande also hired around 200,000 employees across country. And uh, there's a significant uh, uh, social unrest and unemployment problem. So I think uh, the first uh, scenario is not uh, viable. How about uh, the second scenario? That is, uh, you know, we uh, did see you know, the Huarong bailout, uh, you know, not long ago in, in July. And there, basically, the government took a decision and uh, basically restructured the asset side of uh, Huarong. And I, they did not do anything on the debt side. So investors uh, were paid off. Uh, as a result, the contagion effect was very minimal. Uh, but I think. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, scenario may not apply to uh, Evergrande because uh, Evergrande is a private uh, property company, whereas uh, uh, Huarong is a systemically important financial institution owned by Ministry of Finance. And so I think uh, uh, if the government were to a fully bail out Evergrande, uh, there's a huge moral hazard effect. Uh, and so uh, perhaps uh, 
the third scenario is more likely. That is, uh, the government will engage in uh, managed restructuring uh, with the aim to keep the financial, economic, and the social uh, issues at the minimum. And that is, uh, uh, you know, they will continue to ask banks to lend to this uh, big developer so that uh, they can deliver the flats they are building for those uh, 2.5 million people who bought their uh, 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 flats. Uh, uh, meanwhile, you know, uh, the company in certain viable section can continue to operate uh, and, uh, uh, you know, during the process in order to get state uh, a bailout, uh, perhaps the original owners we have to, uh, uh, you know, leave, and uh, perhaps uh, the equity could be wiped out, uh, and uh, the management uh, will have to go. And and at the same time, on the debt side, uh, we need to see some uh, restructuring as well. Uh, given, uh, you know, Evergrande debt has been priced uh, at probably, you know, uh, ten to twenty cents per dollar. This is, could be the price for the investor to take the haircut. Uh, so uh, this approach uh, uh, is a viable one, but uh, I think uh, uh, the regulator need to be very careful not to allow this potential contagion effect uh, uh, to become quite uh, serious. As you mentioned, uh, you know, property sector is still quite important for China's uh, economy. Uh, indirect and direct impact from this sector can contribute around 30% of China's GDP. And so there, I think uh, there's uh, some uh, uh, careful thinking on policy responses uh, need to be done. Uh, if not, uh, indeed, uh, we may see a property sector led uh, a slowdown in China's economy in the coming year. Uh, we already actually uh, revised down our China uh, GDP growth next year from previously 5.5% to current 4.9% uh, 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 for 2022. Thank you so much for laying out these um, three possibilities. And there are so many points uh, we're gonna come back later. But let me turn to you, Andrew. So these debts, they're, they're not just built within one day. They, they were built for even maybe a decade, but what triggered them to blow up right now? Well, that's the interesting thing about the whole Evergrande situation. This is a crisis that's been manufactured by the government. Uh, there's, there's two factors. I mean, obviously the government since the stimulus package in 2009 has essentially been pushing property as a way to save the, uh, the country's economic growth and also the uh, tax base for a lot of the provinces. And the second, so they've been supporting this policy uh, with sort of various, varying degrees of happiness. Uh, more recently in the fall, they instituted a very strict measures called the three red lines to try to basically rein in a lot of these developers that had too much debt. And the reason for all of this is because they, they realize that a, a property market collapse similar to what the United States went through uh, a decade ago would be uncontrollable and could lead to the fall of the Communist Party. I mean, if the whole, uh, you know, uh, financial underpinnings of the of the economic growth uh, were to be disappeared because 30% of GDP disappeared, that would be a calamity. So what they're doing is a kind of a, as as Li Gong uh, astutely pointed out, they're doing kind of a managed uh, uh, reconstruction of the whole situation. But I also think it's I, I I like to think of it more as a muddle through. They're they're basically saying, look, we don't want to have any central uh, government institution like the People's Bank of China, the central bank, or you know one of the big state-owned banks, or as in the Warong case, you know they had it was owned by the Ministry of Finance. They don't want to have any of these uh, actors involved because they're trying to say, okay, we're going to scare the property market. We got to rein it in. But I think a lot, they're forcing the provinces to do a lot of this adjustment. We haven't seen much of it yet. Uh, they, but one of the banks in uh, Liaoning Province was sold by some local, uh, sold to some local provincial uh, uh, government entities. Um, but I think uh, it's a manufactured crisis, and from what I understand, uh, the, they're actually telling the uh, the banks now to start to release, as Li Gong said, a little bit of cash to the property market to kind of soften the blow. As as the downturn comes along, they want to kind of ease the way, like sort of like a jet coming in for a landing you know, on its last uh, engines, basically. Um, so it's a, it's a controllable crisis so far, they hope. It could, it could cycle out of control, but so far it's being controlled. 
So you just mentioned um, three red lines. It looks like a credit tightening measures um, for the government to try to either lower down the housing price or, or just deal with the debt um, issues. Um, but do you, do, you think, do you think the government can achieve what it want to achieve? It looks like they're already lose the regulation on it. Um, what kind of risk? Of, like, they seem to be operating on, on again, off again fashion again. Well, it's a huge risk because, you know, financial contagion, as we found out in the United States, can happen without anybody really planning it. Um, the difference between China and the United States 10 years ago is that they don't have all that bad derivative stuff on Wall Street. That stuff, the pricing was could be communicated very quickly, and it was a, sort of a very a liquid instrument that was that could quickly change in value. Most of the debt in the property market is held in the banks, and they can kind of slow down the rate of, of asset change, basically, they slow the whole process down. So I think their ability to control the whole downturn is superior than what we had in the United States. But the other problem is that I, a lot of investors are asking me, so, okay, so they cut the property market down, what is China going to turn to for economic growth? And uh, that's going to be a very interesting question going into 2022 when uh, Xi Jinping is up for a third uh, leadership uh, succession. Um, and all of a sudden, the the main property engines gr uh, g going away. So uh, a lot of people are guessing they're going to turn back to infrastructure as a way to replace the property bubble. Uh, I also would like to hear Lee Gong's insights on that. What what Andrew said is true. Is like for a lot of selling land is important <clears throat> revenue for local government. Now it seems like the central government is determined to address the debt issue and the housing price then what the province and the local government can do if they can no longer sell um, lands as they um, previously did. Yeah, yeah that's uh, you know, uh, uh, quite a, uh, uh, you know, important question <laughs> to understand the Chinese property market. Uh, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, local government use auction system to auction land, uh, use the revenue to fund the infrastructure and the social uh, spending. And uh, so, you know, uh, from the uh, local government point of view, they want to see land price continue to rise so that can get more revenue. At this moment, around 30 to 40 uh, percent of provincial revenue is uh, uh, owning to the, you know, it's derived from the land sales. And so uh, this naturally pushed up for China's uh, property market in general. So to address this issue, there are some options, but the options uh, uh, are quite difficult to be adopted at this stage. That is, uh, China has been debating or uh, drafting uh, this property uh, tax uh, for the last five years, <laughs> uh, but we have not seen this uh, property tax to be uh, commented uh, or enacted. Uh, and I think uh, uh, to address uh, uh, local government fin financing issue, you know, this uh, property tax uh, is the right way to go. Uh, if they can have a steady source of financing, perhaps uh, Chinese local government won't rely on land sales for their, uh, you know, development needs, uh, social spending. And uh, also, I think uh, if they can collect uh, uh, some property tax uh, from the wealthy, and the money could be used to build more social housing for the young generation, right? I think this is a quite important uh, uh, policy, but uh, uh, strangely, uh, it has, has taken such a long time and, you know, to be uh, uh, you know, rolled out. Uh, I think perhaps in the next five years, uh, uh, on the President Xi's third term, perhaps, uh, uh, we could uh, uh, see uh, China's property tax. Yeah, um, so in your uh, remarks earlier, you mentioned that an unstable housing price might stir maybe social unrest. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like how important is real estate market in average Chinese citizen's life? Yeah, property is a very important store of wealth. Uh, you know, the PBOC estimated that 66% uh, of Chinese uh, household wealth is on property. 
So you can imagine that uh, if Huarong led uh, a property market slump, uh, uh, then created uh, a major uh, price decline in Chinese property market. That means a uh, lot of people, especially those people who bought into the market uh, recently, may experience negative equity uh, in their uh, prop uh, property holding. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, this will have a major implication on China's consumption growth. Uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, developers may not want to build any property. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, growth will uh, slow down uh, quite uh, uh, significantly. Uh, so indeed, I think, uh, uh, the, you know, property price uh, uh, too high, you know, is a worrisome sign for the government, uh, but the government does not want to see, you know, a major property market uh, downturn. If China's property market were to experience, say, uh, 10 to uh, 20 percent uh, price decline, uh, it will create a lot of uh, a social issue. Uh, not only, uh, you know, banks will see not rising numbers performing loans, uh, uh, but also, you know, uh, a lot of unhappy campers <laughs> and, uh, you know, people's consumption uh, will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, affected quite negatively. So the government won't keep the housing price in certain uh, range uh, without really having the real estate bubble um, burst at all. Uh, that So it has all those tightening measures, regulations. Uh, let's step back and look at the whole um, economy. It seems like the regulations on the real estate market that coordinates with other policy changes in other areas, like the overnight banning of tutoring schools or, or gaming industry. Can you comment a little bit? Do you, do you think this kind of um, fast and the dramatic policy will be working? Will, will work at all? What, what's the risks? The, you, the question is to me or to Andrew? To both of you. <laughs> go ahead, Lee Gong, you, you go first. Um, okay, I, I think, uh, you know, indeed, uh, uh, as a China watcher for the last uh, uh, 20 some years, I'm a bit surprised by how, uh, you know, uh, rapidly uh, recent policy roll rollout has become you know over the last 40 years uh, one of the uh, you know uh, successful uh, experience in the chinese uh, policy making is that uh, they often take a pilot approach a graduism when announce important policy uh, but uh, over the last uh, uh, few months we tend to see you know, policy uh, issued uh, in a uh, quite rapid way uh, without uh, uh, understanding the priority, uh, often uncoordinated, uh, uh, then that has created a lot of confusion. And uh, some policies, for example, this, uh, you know, dual control policy uh, in China's uh, energy uh, uh, intensity and energy consumption um, is uh, uh, fairly you know, uh, uh, arbitrary, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, such goals uh, uh, could be achieved in two or three years across economic cycle, rather than being enforced uh, uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. And so as a result, we see, you know, a lot of uh, provinces would have to cut their electricity supply even to residential areas. And that has then created a lot of social uh, uh, displeasure. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, this type of policy implementation uh, need to be reflected. I hope, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, we are coming to this inflection point that is uh, the next Monday, China will issue its third quarter GDP number. If the number were to below a market consensus at this uh, uh, level that is worrisome. Uh, perhaps in the following week, uh, the Politburo will need to think about uh, uh, the policy again. Um, you know, uh, if there's some reflection, um, perhaps we can think some policy pullbacks 
from now onward. Uh, uh, after all, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have observed that uh, international investors uh, are, doubt, are doubting whether uh, China's uh, uh, market is still investable. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, a lot of private sector uh, Chinese uh, entrepreneurs uh, are, also, are also quite concerned. And so I think uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, this inflection point uh, comes early uh, that will pull China uh, from the brink of policy uh, excessiveness. What do you think? Yeah, I would, yeah I, I, I totally agree. I think some of these policies are arbitrary, but I think more broadly, there's a couple things. First of all, I was very surprised that Xi Jinping uh, engaged in the downturn, the cutback in the property sector just a year ahead of his uh, attempt to have a third um, uh, term. Um, I think he maybe they believed that they had to do it because the property sector was getting out unaffordable for people and also could create a crisis. But that was a surprise. The other things, uh, common prosperity, which is kind of a distribution of income thing, you know, cut back on the education system, the gaming system. I, I view that as basically Trump populism. I think it's I think it's he's throwing carrots to the population in China as a way to show that he's behind people and to try to make sure that the authority of the Communist Party remains intact while the economy is slowing. And that's the key point. It, you, if you're having this difficult situation, you want to make sure that the messaging is correct, that the ideology is in place and that the party is strong. So the problem is, as we discussed earlier, the tax base is not really there for a lot of these things. You can't change the distribution of income unless you institute a property tax or higher taxes on the middle class, which would be disastrous. And you can't, um, you know, you can't uh, have the large tech companies distribute money for charity because that's charity is only 0.15 percent of GDP or something. It's very low. So uh, a lot of the the goals uh, that the state is trying to do are basically unachievable. So they end up being, I hate to say it, slogans more than policies. Um, so I'm not expecting a lot there on any of this um, except for the property uh, situation, which is quite serious. And that's going to be a major change, change in the China's economic uh, story in 2022. So you said there are not, so, so far there is no sign that they're going to enforce property tax. Then what, what other tools does the um, government have? And well, what that's the problem. The I mean, I mean the data shows that one of the big problems over the past 10 years is too much money has gone to a lot of local state firms that have squandered the money. That's a big chunk of, of, of lost economic growth. So first of all, they've got to figure out a way to start steering money to more productive firms, which would be either local productive SMEs or even national firms. That's, that's the first step. Second step is uh, you could go to the infrastructure route, which is what they did eight years ago, basically just build more uh, roads and bridges, which is not terribly helpful for, for growth. Um, the third step is kind of this new economy stuff, which, you know, they've just clipped the wings of all the service to, uh, to the gaming companies and so forth. And the semiconductor area, they've put in about four or five hundred billion dollars into it over time. That's going to take a decade to come through. So I think I think they're in a real uh, difficult position, which is why I partly think the ideology, ideological control is so strong now, partly because the economic story is very weak. That's fascinating. Um, I have one last question, and then uh, I will receive two questions from the audience. My question is quite simple for investors. Um, do you think the real estate is still a reliable investment? Would you <laughs> would you suggest people to invest in that anymore, buying more house? Li Gang, would you like to? <laughs> uh, I, I would think that uh, we need to be very uh, cautious uh, in investing in China's property sector. Um, unlike uh, 10 years ago, regardless where you invest, uh, you think you will have value gains despite the rental yield is very uh, patchy. And I think, uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, if uh, uh, you are in the market for a, a place uh, uh, to live, uh, I think uh, uh, it's still worthwhile uh, to uh, buy a property, uh, perhaps uh, 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 in the coming quarters, uh, there could be opportunities uh, for investors to get into uh, uh, certain markets. Uh, but also, uh, when you invest in China, look at uh, those five major 
um, you know, city clusters, the government intend to uh, continue to uh, build and refine from, you know, Jinjingji uh, in the northern part to uh, Chengdu, Chongqing area, and mid part uh, Hunan and Hubei and uh, uh, Yang's Delta area in the Great Bay area, that is, uh, you know, nine cities will connect with uh, uh, Hong Kong and uh, Macau. Uh, you know, current infrastructure building suggesting that, uh, uh, you know, small ci smaller cities uh, uh, could see uh, more population growth uh, uh, in the near future. So I think uh, uh, this is the reason I, I try to say that uh, perhaps this is not the right time to uh, suddenly, you know, turn away, you know, China's property uh, investment uh, property market um, and uh, urbanization, by the way, by all means uh, is still uh, undergoing. I think uh, even from the government point of view, uh, property sector will continue uh, uh, drive China's growth uh, somewhat, though the marginal impact will be less and less in the future. And also there's the right way to address uh, the rising housing price issue, that is through taxation and through other means, uh, uh, rather than, you know, just to crack down one wayward developer, uh, which may uh, create a uh, major contagion effect uh, uh, down the road. I think uh, here, in addition to what uh, Andrew mentioned, uh, uh, I would think that uh, China's PBOC and the regulators need to use some innovative policy tools uh, uh, in dealing with the potential fault or contagion owing to the uh, Evergrande default. That is uh, whether PBOC need to set up some kind of credit facility oriented directly to those developers in need, uh, because many of them are still very viable. Um, they have a good business model. Um, you know, they may face the liquidity issue, but uh, through this kind of credit facility, you know, they can get some kind of help for, for them to weather through the current very uh, difficult uh, uh, condition. Meanwhile, perhaps uh, on the demand side, uh, uh, you know, uh, the mortgage rate uh, uh, could be cut uh, and the local government uh, may also play a role by relaxing their hukou system so that uh, more young people can settle uh, in, in their city. Uh, so by using this uh, a set of comprehensive policy, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, China can stamp off this potential contagion, contagion effect only to this uh, second large, largest developer uh, potential default. Andrew, want to take a crack? Um, well, I, I, th I think, uh, as I don't think that there is going to be a central government bailout. I think they're desperate to avoid that. Um, if they could provide new policy tools, that would be quite interesting, but they would probably do that through local proxies through the provinces, because I don't think the PBOC wants to be have a, its face on the picture of a, helping out the property market. Uh, so I'll put it there. I think we're about out of time. Right. Uh, we actually have um, one minute for one question. Um, how likely is from Mike McC how likely is the crime to rise in China if rural citizens lose their savings in a real estate crash? I guess that's a question for Li Gang. Or Andrew. I can, I can take yeah. a stab at that. I mean, okay. restructuring of the state sector 20 years ago put 6 million people out of work, mainly in the North, and they've never got their jobs back. Um, so they were, they were able to do that without leading to unrest. Things have probably changed since then because of the media environment. So the chances of a widespread popular uh, up, uh, uprising or upset over this is much higher. So that's why I think local provincial governors and party people are gonna be responsible for making sure that there's enough money to keep people from protesting in the streets, but not enough money to bail out the property sector. Thank you so much for this fascinating discussion. With that, I'm afraid I, um, I have to end this panel. Um, and hand it over back to Dinda. Well, that was just so interesting. And thank you both, um, Andrew and Li Gang. You know, it sounds like 
the government, in your views, the government has the wherewithal to avoid a Lehman, a so-called Lehman moment, um, but that it's going to be a very difficult and uh, delicate problem for the Chinese government to manage. So thank you for sharing uh, your insights and nuance on that subject. Uh, we're really thrilled to have you. So you. our final conversation for today is about Hong Kong. And um, there's been, there have been many questions, of course, about the future of Hong Kong as a financial center following the turmoil, turmoil of recent years and Beijing's steps to assert title, tighter controls. And so we are especially pleased today to present a keynote fireside chat with Paul Chan, who is Hong Kong's financial secretary. Interviewing him is Zuraida Ibrahim, executive editor of the South China Morning Post, who are our strategic partners in this conference. And we're very, very grateful to them for helping to organize this uh, great conversation. Because of the time difference, uh, we decided to pre-tape this conversation. Uh, but I assure you, it's a fascinating discussion in which the financial secretary responds very directly to everyone's concerns. Um, so I'm going to turn off my camera and we will bring on financial secretary, Paul Chan. So we'll kick off with the most interesting business report that you just put up last week. Mm -hmm. Would you like to share with us who is your target audience when you mentioned uh, things like how there was black clad violence in 2019 and then there was suppression by the United States against China and all these uh, have had an effect on Hong Kong's economy but we are now ready to take off. Well, this business environment report is targeting uh, at business leaders both global and local uh, because over the past two years we have gone through a very difficult period uh, starting from the uh, social violence uh, in the second half of 2019 and then the subsequent enactment of the national security law which in fact had returned Hong Kong to stability and law and order but there had been some uh, misreporting uh, some uh, anxiety uh, about the enactment of this particular piece of legislation. Uh, we want to set the record straight uh, as to what had happened in Hong Kong and also uh, demonstrate to the international business community that our unique advantages are still there, uh, very well maintained. The one country, two system arrangement is operating very well and there are boundless opportunities in Hong Kong uh, because of our economic integration with the mainland, uh, our special uh, status as our special status as afforded by the one country, two system arrangement. But do you think just a report will do uh, what you identified as being necessary to set the record straight? Well, we have been also doing uh, marketing and promotion. Uh, not just for the report, but to, uh, but to share with investors and business leaders about the business opportunities here. As you know, under the 14 five-year plan of the mainland, Hong Kong has been given a very unique status uh, in terms of our financial services, uh, our innovation and technology sector, uh, as well as, say for example, our a unique role in reaching the East and the West in terms of uh, culture and arts. Um, that is one area. The other area is the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area development. Uh, this is a, a market of over 80 million people. The per capita GDP is about US $23,000. So uh, it is a growing, a pretty affluent market, uh, offering tremendous opportunities. And we do think that the international business leaders uh, would be very interested in export this market. Um, lately, there have been measures announced by the central government, like the uh, Wealth Connect scheme, the Bond Connect South Bank, and the impending launch of the Asia Future contracts on a stock exchange. These are just some of the examples, the, some of the exciting news about the deepening uh, connectivity uh, between the Hong Kong capital market and the mainland capital market, which is a very convenient conduit.
for international business investors uh, who are interested uh, in the capital markets of the mainland. But Mr. Chen, wouldn't you say that Hong Kong has suffered reputational damage because of the imposition of the national security law? And I would add even the electoral reform uh, that was imposed by Beijing. Well, we suffer reputational damage because of the social violence happened in 2019. And uh, at that time, it, it was quite <coughs> chaotic here. When I visited uh, the US and the UK, uh, business leaders at that time, the question put to me was whether Hong Kong is still a safe place to do business. Uh, now that uh, with the enactment of the national security law, uh, Hong Kong is returned to law and order, returning to stability. The recent changes to the uh, electoral system is to enable us to focus on the development, uh, particularly social and economic development of Hong Kong and not just uh, like the past uh, got ourselves into political struggling. Right. But again, the concern seems to be, yes, there's stability and order, peace has been restored, but mm. what about the liberties of individuals, expatriates who want to make Hong Kong a place for them to do business and to play as well? Well, the freedom of travel, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of capital flow, and as well as our linked exchange rate system. All these are guaranteed in the basic law. Uh, we are fully aware of the fact that the unique advantage of Hong Kong is the one country, two system special arrangement. Uh, so under this arrangement, Hong Kong still operates on basically a capital market uh, economy. Uh, the legal system is different from the mainland, the independent judiciary, which is very important to us and also to the in international investors. So all this uh, we have been able to maintain and we will defend this very dearly. But what do you say to investors who uh, are still very tentative about uh, Hong Kong as an international financial centre because these moves by Beijing are seen as an attempt to mainlandize Hong Kong? Well, I think uh, facts and figures perhaps may speak louder than words. If I may share with you a set of, a set of figures, uh, after the enactment of the national security law uh, in the middle of 2020, in the following 12 months, actually our IPO fundraising increased by more than 50% to uh, 500 billion Hong Kong dollars. Our asset and managed asset managed. Uh, I mean, the uh, wealth and asset management business, the asset under management figure, has increased by 21% in 2020, uh, reaching about 3.5 trillion Hong Kong dollars. And over this period, after the enactment of the uh, national security law, we, we saw capital floating into Hong Kong. Uh, in the second half of 2020 to the order of about 300 billion Hong Kong dollars. The exchange rate of Hong Kong remain on the strong side. The linked exchange rate system is working very well. Uh, in terms of foreign business in Hong Kong, the survey result is basically maintaining the same. Over 9,000 mainland and international companies uh, having uh, their operations in Hong Kong and a substantial number of these are regional headquarters. Uh, the distribution of these 9,000 remain basically intact. So over 1,000 from the US, uh, over 1,000 from Japan, uh, close to 700 from the UK, over 1,000 from Europe. So all these figures indicate that the, the attractiveness and competitiveness of Hong Kong as a business hub as an IFC remain very strong. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, the uh, UK think tank, Shang, uh, released the Global Financial Center Index. Hong Kong uh, ranked number three, just behind uh, New York and London. Uh, back in 2019, we slide to the sixth mm -hmm. place. So mm -hmm. all this, just some of the examples, saying that, uh, proving that Hong Kong remain very uh, very attractive, uh, remain very open for business. 
Even the Pfizer Institute uh, rank us as the number one uh, fearless economy. And the World Economic Forum in ranking our competitiveness still gives us a very high score. So you do not see uh, the exit of Western companies? You have not uh, seen any evidence of that? Uh, we have seen uh, a few companies uh, for different reasons, maybe relocating some of their business. Uh, they, they may have their own commercial considerations. But at the same time, we have seen companies moving in uh, from the US, from mainland, and also we have seen, say for example, for, uh, for people, for startup business, uh, we have over 3,000 in Hong Kong and over one, about one third of them are from overseas. So uh, in terms of, uh, of our attractiveness, uh, we are very confident. Lately, because of the uh, Wealth Connect uh, announcement, we have seen banks and insurance companies expanding their operations in Hong Kong, renting uh, a additional space, uh, people like AIA, Manulife, and some of the global banks uh, increased their headcount in Hong Kong to capture their particular business opportunities. Right. Um, we talked earlier about uh, the national security law and the electoral reform uh, changes that Beijing imposed. There was also one other law that mm -hmm. uh, preoccupied the business community mm -hmm. earlier this year, and this was the anti-sanctions law, which was passed in June in Beijing. And there were fears, or there, uh, well, there was actually talked that it was going to be inserted into Hong Kong's legislative framework. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was on the agenda when the MPCSC met in <laughs> August mm -hmm. at the start on Tuesday, but by Friday it had disappeared off <laughs> the, of the agenda. Mm -hmm. So what happened there? Well, the anti-foreign sanction law uh, promulgated by the mainland authority, uh, at one time <coughs> there was speculation whether this piece of legislation would be included in uh, Annex V to, to the basic law and then subsequently uh, to be enacted in Hong Kong. Uh, but the, the actual situation is that it has not been included in Annex V and there is no timetable for that particular piece of legislation uh, to be included there and then for subsequent amendment in Hong Kong. There is no timetable. So uh, what we have seen is that uh, last year at the height of uh, Sino-US tension, uh, we suffer uh, unilateral so-called sanctions from the US. Uh, but Hong Kong's financial market remain very resilient. Uh, the global banks in Hong Kong uh, last year actually record a, uh, a record year in terms of their business performance. And our reaction to those sanctions are very rational and calm. Um, the business confidence uh, are pop have been properly maintained. So uh, I just want to uh, let the international business leaders know that Hong Kong remain a premier international financial center. Uh, our financial services industry is very strong, uh, not just on the IPO equity markets, but in the coming few years, we will be uh, pushing ahead in terms of internationalization of renminbi. Uh, we will push ahead with our bond market, our green and sustainable finance, and also another area very attractive to global banks is the asset and wealth management business. Uh, we are very confident that we are very, very well poised to capture these particular business opportunities. Right, before we uh, move on on these business opportunities that you've just cited, I wonder if I could press you again on the anti-sanctions law. Mm. Apart from the assurance that it's not on the timetable, can we also be sure that there is no other more targeted law that could be devised either by Hong Kong itself mm -hmm. or by the mainland so that we can give greater assurance to the international business community? Because there was talk of a more targeted law so that international companies are not caught between a rock and a hard place between mm -hmm. implementing Chinese sanctions and US sanctions. Well, uh, there is no such uh, initiative or piece of legislation uh, 
uh, in my agenda. So it is not on our latest screen. Mm. Okay, going on to the opportunities that you've just cited about the interna internationalization of the RMB and uh, the Southbound Connect opportunities mm. and GBA, mm. how can international companies participate and in what ways can they contribute and be confident that they can benefit from these opportunities at a time of grave US-China tensions? Well, you know, uh, Hong Kong's unique status uh, has been playing a very important role in breaching uh, the two markets, the mainland markets and the capital markets. And uh, under the one country, two system arrangement, uh, we are practicing common law, uh, independent judiciary. Our regulatory system, <coughs> our regulatory regime is well recognized and very transparent. And in fact, in terms of our track record performance, uh, no matter it is IPO uh, or the Northbound Connect arrangements facilitating international investors investing into the mainland stock market, uh, we have been doing very well, uh, very successful. Uh, the North Bank, uh, mm -hmm. North Bank uh, Stock Connect, when it was first launched back in 2014, uh, the turnover was about slightly less than 140 billion. Now it is uh, over 150 trillion dollars, huge. Uh, this is just the Stock Connect. Bond Connect, uh, we have been also doing very well. And we have also looked at some statistics. In fact, uh, international investors can invest into mainland capital market full QV. But statistics indicate to us that uh, about 70% of this inbound uh, investment into the stock market of the mainland are via the connect arrangements for Hong Kong. Uh, we are confident that with deepening this connect arrangement, expanding the scope of coverage, and rolling out risk management products like Asia Futures and others uh, in the pipeline, uh, we will be a preferred uh, conduit and destination for international investors interested uh, in investing uh, in the growth of the mainland. Uh, these are some of the measures that uh, Chief Executive Carrie Lam mentioned in mm -hmm. a policy address earlier this week. Uh, out of all these measures, which are the ones that you are most optimistic will take off almost immediately? For example, internationalization mm -hmm. of RMB, can that happen very soon for, uh, for Southbound uh, mm -hmm. Stock Connect? Well, the Wealth Connect will be the most imminent. Okay. Yeah, that would uh, facilitate international capital into the Greater Bay Area and the people in the Greater Bay Area investing into the international market step by step. Uh, initially, uh, investing through the banks uh, with products with low to medium risk, mm -hmm. but going forward, uh, this will, will be expanded. Um, Bond Connect South Bank is also very immediate. Uh, we will see more institutional fundings from the mainland investing into international bond markets. And on this, uh, <clears throat> we have rolled out initiative to promote our bond market. We have a, a funding scheme to subsidize issuers uh, to issue bonds in Hong Kong, in particular green bonds. Mm -hmm. So these two, uh, asset management, uh, bonds, I think these are the most immediate. Mm -hmm. Uh, as to the connect arrangements, uh, the stock connect, uh, I think we will continue to do very well. Uh, because for international investors, uh, if, we, if we look at the uh, passive index funds, uh, they will continue to increase their weighting on A shares because of the growing of the mainland economy. So capital will continue to flow from the west to the east. So we are very well positioned. Right. But even as this is happening uh, with the exchange here, there's also greater attention that the central government is paying to the Beijing exchange, Guangzhou, mm -hmm. and even possibly or most mm -hmm. likely Macau. Mm -hmm. How will they feature in the competition with Hong Kong? Will Hong Kong stay ahead 
uh, I'm sure it's very far <laughs> ahead, but are you even concerned about the potential competition or attention that is being paid by the CPG to these other exchanges? Well, actually, in terms of financial services, in terms of uh, Hong Kong being an international financial center, the competition is from often, not just the mainland. We are very conscious of uh, this situation, highly competitive. That's why we need to constantly remind ourselves we need to stay ahead of the game. Uh, to, in 2018, we amend our listing rules to allow new economy companies with greater voting mm. rights to, to be listed on our stock exchange. We are now biotech companies without profit track record or even revenue records to list here. Now we become the world's second largest biotech fundraising hub. Uh, we are we have also re rolling our initiative to attract more private equity funds to be set up in Hong Kong to make our financial services, the, the, the ecosystem of our financial services sector more vibrant. Uh, recently, we launched a consultation about the Hong Kong version of SPAC. Mm. So we are working very hard. Uh, we constantly remind ourselves <coughs> we need to stay ahead of the game. And when we look at the neighboring uh, stock exchanges, uh, I think we serve different fun functions. Say, for example, one obvious function is for those mainland exchanges, uh, the, the investors and the capital are more onshore. Mm -hmm. uh, we are more offshore. international and offshore. And also, we have to one distinction uh, between us and the mainland exchanges is the, the uh, the special one country, two system arrangement. And that, under that arrangement, our unique competitive advantage. Uh, the, say for example, the common law legal system. Uh, look at the, the other two international financial centers, be it London or New York, all practice common law. Uh, our independent judiciary, our regulatory regime, the very uh, transparent, and internationally allied uh, regulatory regime. Um, the, the certainty uh, in policy making, uh, the efficiency of our market, and the ease of moving funds in and out of Hong Kong, uh, the linked exchange rate system. I think all these are very unique to Hong Kong, uh, and we have to maintain this and preserve this, and play to our strength. Uh, uh, in terms of, uh, on the one hand, preserving this uh, syst systematic advantages, and on the other hand, portal innovations, uh, keeping uh, ourselves uh, ahead of the market. I'm glad you mentioned product innovation. Wouldn't you say that uh, when it comes to spec, Hong Kong has been a bit behind time because you just started mm -hmm. your consultation in September mm -hmm. and it feels like you will go ahead with it and the consultation is almost pro forma. So what exactly is the thinking? We have been very careful because, mm -hmm. you know, in Hong Kong all along, we do not want backdoor listing. So uh, on the one hand, we need to innovate uh, to make reference to uh, international practices. As you know, spec at one time, particularly back in 2019, uh, have been very uh, vibrant in the U.S. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, I mean at 2020. Mm. In 2020, spec have been very vibrant in the U.S. Uh, at the beginning of 2021, was still very strong, and then there were concerns about investor protection, which is very legitimate. So uh, taking stock of their experience and taking into consideration here in Hong Kong, the investor profile uh, a little different. Mm -hmm. Apart from institutional investors, we have a bigger pool of retail investors. Uh, the regulatory approach is different. Say, for example, in the U.S., they have class lawsuit, and here we do not have that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have been very careful in in designing and trying to craft out a a Hong Kong version of spec, which, at the one hand, uh, attractive. Uh, to uh, to fundraising, and at the on the other hand, uh, offering uh, investor proper investor protection. How soon do you can do you think this can take off in the first queue well, of next year? Uh, very soon, because the consultation period for this spec <laughs> was is just forty five days. So right. uh, 
we want to move forward as fast as possible. One other measure that was mentioned in Ms Lam's policy address was the setting up of a cross-border mm. sandbox for fintech. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share with us what are the plans on that front and how soon can we see some initiatives? We have been doing this uh, for quite some time. Uh, actually, fintech is very important uh, in the future, uh, particularly in the digital economy. And given the the flow of capital between Hong Kong and the mainland. And this flow of capital, this uh, uh, inter internationalization of <coughs> renminbi would pose challenge to regulators. But we do not want to restrain our growth because of regulation. Uh, we want to facilitate product innovations. We want to facilitate uh, the adoption of technology uh, in the different area of uh, financial services, be it banking or insurance. So uh, the idea is for, for products or product innovations which intend to be launched, not just in Hong Kong, but also in the Greater Bay Area, say for example, mm -hmm. the regulators will work together to validate those, uh, validate those, uh, those proposals, those innovations. Uh, this is very important and we look forward to closer cooperation with our counterparts on the mainland. Mm -hmm. uh, one centerpiece of Ms Lam's policy address was this vision for a new uh, center of economic activity in Hong Kong, which is to the north of Hong Kong, yes. close to the Shenzhen, mm. close to Shenzhen, close to the border. Mm. Um, what are your own thoughts on this vision? Is it realistic? Is it how, how much is it going to cost and who mm. will fund it? This is a shared vision. Uh, this is very important for the future of Hong Kong. Uh, traditionally, the economic activities in Hong Kong is basically in the south. I mean, the Hong Kong Island and then Kowloon uh, for industrial areas is Guntong, which mm. is Kowloon East, and then Kowloon West uh, into the new territories like Kwai Chong. This, we, we have been successful you know, on this that also pose challenges because for the economic development of Hong Kong, we need more than financial services. Uh, although we have been successful in financial services, but in terms of offering employment, in terms of driving our economic growth, uh, we need to be more diversified. So innovation and technology must be the way forward. But innovation and technology, we cannot do it ourselves alone. We have to work with the neighboring uh, cities like Shenzhen, uh, like uh, Dongguan because they have manufacturing, they have, manufacturing, uh, they have very good uh, commercialization and also they have the market. So uh, if we are to work with the mainland, naturally geographic proximity is important. So. Uh, Particularly after 1997, uh, the, the boundary area between Hong Kong and the mainland, along that area in the past is undeveloped. <coughs> so it is very, very natural for us to take a holistic review of those boundaries, boundary areas, and also take a look of the cost boundary facilities, uh, transportation infrastructures to enable us to better integrate with uh, Shenzhen, with the Greater Bay Area, to facilitate people flow, uh, not just capital mm -hmm. flow. So the northern metropolis, met, metropolis uh, vision is very much uh, a shared vision, a way to put Hong Kong forward. Uh, in summary, that could be the south of Hong Kong is financial services, the north part of Hong Kong is innovation and technology. And that is not just for industry development, but also release land to provide uh, housing uh, and other facilities for the people of Hong Kong. But Mr. Chen, you're in charge of the purse strings of Hong Kong. Hmm. Who will foot the bill for this northern metropolis? Uh, this is a very big vision. Uh, to realize this vision, we need to do it by phases. 
And I do think in the process we have to be creative in terms of coming up with a package of financing arrangements uh, which involve, say for example, private sector. Uh, the, the exact form of involvement can be worked out, whether for certain uh, part of activities uh, that could be public-private partnership, uh, whether we should issue green bonds, say for example. Uh, apart from institutions, uh, perhaps we may also <coughs> involve retail investors so that the people of Hong Kong can also own this particular vision and be benefit from it. So uh, going forward, I think uh, this particular vision to be realized would be perhaps by phases and subject to feasibility. Uh, in each phases, we can work out a tailor-made package of financing. But uh, Ms. Lam and her administration, of which you are a part, have only less than nine months to mm -hmm. her tenure. So how realistic is it that you are putting forth a vision where you might not be around to realise this ambition? Well, the, the discussion about the development of Hong Kong, uh, the diversification of our economy, uh, the need to <coughs> better integrate with uh, the mainland, particularly the Greater Bay Area, the need to have closer cooperation with cities like Shenzhen has been, this discussion has been in the community for a long time. Uh, I do think uh, the current proposal is a very natural one, uh, which would be able to, to, to gather the support of the public at large. If this vision is a shared vision, having the support of the people at large, I'm sure uh, this will be moved forward uh, in the next term of government and because this is a shared vision of the people. So uh, I think it is important for us uh, to having uh, consider the 14 five-year plan, the uh, GBA development, the recent announcement of deepening the cooperation between Hong Kong and Shenzhen in the Chin. Shanghai area mm -hmm. uh, to put forward uh, a vision to put forward a uh, workable solution although at this stage still high level uh, for the community to to discuss and to come to uh, come to consensus uh, majority views as to the priorities uh, of this development which is huge uh, Mr. Chen, going back to your business environment report for Hong Kong, uh, the United States featured prominently in it. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned about how Hong Kong was a pawn in this greater China-US rivalry. Yeah. And uh, now we hear that President Xi Jinping and uh, President Joe Biden are due to hold a virtual meeting before the year is over. What are your expectations for Hong Kong in such, for such a meeting? Where will we feature? Well, Hong Kong has all along been playing a very unique role uh, in China's economic development. Um, the Sino-US relationship is the most important uh, bilateral relationship. Uh, in this time of the world and going forward this will remain to be the most important bilateral relationships. Uh, in the report we set out what happened in Hong Kong in the past two years because we thought that we should not shy away from what ha actually ha happened here and let's face it and uh, move on. Um, the, the <coughs> tension between the U.S. and the mainland mm -hmm. may, be, may continue to, to last in the coming decade, uh, although there may, may be, uh, the, the tension may, there may be high times or low, and low times, but this situation, this competition uh, will not go away. So for us, uh, we must recognize that. Uh, and the consequential effect of this on the 
international political and economic landscape. And the consequential challenge that we in Hong Kong will have to face, say for example, uh, maybe more volatility in the financial market, maybe we have to be more careful in terms of maintaining the financial stability of Hong Kong, uh, in also devising uh, various contingency plans to cater for different scenarios uh, so that we are well prepared no matter what happened. And at the same time, at the same time, I do think that uh, uh, between the U.S. and the mainland, there are a lot of areas for collaboration. Fighting climate change is a consensus one. But even in terms of economic growth, be a better, be a better world. I think there is a lot of areas that uh, these two big countries can work together. And in this process, Hong Kong will continue to play a very useful and unique role. And f in the process, we will benefit from, uh, from playing this role uh, to achieve our economic and social development. Um, Mr. Chen, picking up on your point about the importance of maintaining mm. financial stability, mm. uh, as you know, China's over-leveraged property market, mm. uh, the fallout from there is being felt uh, mm. in China, obviously, mm. and in several other places. Uh, you've said before that the risk to Hong Kong is minimal, the risk of uh, exposure, debt exposure is mm. minimal. Yeah. Uh, but now we hear there's a second uh, big property company mm. that's uh, fallen on its mm. uh, sword. It hasn't been able to pay, been able to pay $205 billion. So there seems to be the risk of contagion. Mm. How worried are you about the effect of this on the Hong Kong economy and the larger global economy? Well, on the Hong Kong financial stability, we have assessed the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the banking system's exposure to companies like Evergrande uh, is only about 0 0.05 percent of our banking assets, so very small. We, the, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority has also uh, monitored <coughs> those mainland developers who have caused uh, the so-called the red lines, the regulatory red lines of the mainland in terms of their liquidity position. Uh, the total exposure of the, the banking sector to these uh, mainland developers uh, are also is very, very small also. And many of these loans are collateralized. So in terms of the effect on our own financial stability is very minimal. We are not concerned. Uh, this SFC, Securities and Futures Commission, mm -hmm. has also done a similar exercise among the securities house, what we call the, the, the licensed corporations. Uh, again, uh, the exposure is m very small. We also look at it from the investor protection angle. Uh, most of these high yield bonds uh, are for institutional investors and professional investors. So it would not affect retail investors as such. So on that, uh, we, we feel safe. But on the other hand, we are very conscious of the fact that uh, this uh, event may have contagious effect on the mainland developers. Uh, on the mainland and the consequential impact of the viability of uh, these companies. We are keeping a very close watch, including uh, whether this, uh, if uh, developed further, whether it may or may not affect the mainland economy. And as a result, uh, the growth, uh, economic growth on the mainland. At this stage, it is premature to make any conclusion. Uh, but we have been very, very careful uh, in terms of monitoring uh, all these possibilities. Um, Mr. Chen, a fair number of our audience uh, for this summit are actually from the U.S. Yeah. So uh, in, do you have any parting words in terms of your optimism for Hong Kong? What is it premised on and what do you have to say to potential investors outside of Hong Kong? Yeah. Well, we in Hong Kong have gone through two extraordinary years. We have overcome all these challenges. 
uh, now with the enactment of the uh, national security law, with the uh, changes in the electoral system, uh, Hong Kong has returned to stability, law and order. And uh, we are trying to focus our energy in social and economic development. The one country, two system arrangement has been operating here very well. Our legal system, uh, our independent judiciary are very well recognized. And the business opportunity here is huge. Uh, the 14 five-year plan uh, reinforces Hong Kong's special status in the financial services area, in innovation and technology, uh, in our uh, trade, as well as, say for example, dispute resolutions. Uh, risk management, so a lot of opportunities. Under the GBA uh, development, Hong Kong is also very well positioned. So I would urge uh, our business leaders, uh, the US business leaders, uh, to find time to visit us yeah, when the COVID situation uh, is better, to see for yourself uh, the, the situation here and to feel the uh, optimism and the vibrance of, of this city. Uh, we are open for business, ready to do more business, and in fact, the financial service sector last year was their record year in terms of profitability and performance. And the first half of this year, they are also doing very well. So uh, tremendous opportunities, uh, and we, we want to share these opportunities with uh, international investors and let's work together and be benefit from it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chan. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Shrada. Thank, thank you. you. So that was really fascinating. And I must say, Paul Chan, you know, thank you so much for your uh, optimism and for your candor. Um, and Zuraida, thank you so much for helping to make that fascinating conversation happen. Um, for those of us who spent many years living in Hong Kong, of course, we're rooting for Hong Kong. So we're happy to hear uh, Secretary Chan say that Hong Kong is open for business and ready to do business. Um, so with that, we're done for today. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, and thank you again to today's amazing speakers. We will put that um, interview just now with Secretary Chan online. And, and in fact, indeed the entire conference will be posted. Um, and so you will be able to get a recap on it if you wanna look at it again. Uh, I hope so much that you will join us again tomorrow at same time, 8 a.m. Eastern time, 8 p.m. China time uh, for conversations with Ronnie Chan, uh, Ma Jun, China's green finance guru, some of China's top tech VC investors, and experts on China's Gen Z consumer market, and much more. Uh, so it's going to be a great uh, series of discussions tomorrow, and I hope you will all tune again. Tune in again. Thank you for joining us today. Take care. <laughs>